Good morning, Mr. Ramachandran. You, you're on mute. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I... Good morning, Girish. How are okay, you? Good morning. How are you? Very well. Yeah, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh... Morning, Koshal. Morning, Girish. Morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm actually stuck on roads, so I'll keep yeah, myself yeah. mute. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, Uh, Ms. Chakravarti, is uh, the ambassador, has he joined, uh, Mr. Vinay Kumar? Has he, I mean, so uh, once you give okay, we can begin the session. Good, good, good morning, morning, ambassador. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Seth. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Good morning, Excellency. Good morning, Excellency. Good morning, Excellency. Good morning. <laughs> Yeah. We are ready to start, Amita. Yeah, yeah, we should. It's 9.30, okay. we can begin. We should begin. Okay. So maybe maybe I'll I'll uh, start off first of all. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, Mr. Vinay Kumar, Ambassador of India to Myanmar, Mr. Mo Kiwa Ong, Ambassador of Myanmar to India, Mr. Zaw Min Win, President of the Union of Myanmar Federation of Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And uh, Mr. Srikant Somani, Chairman of uh, CII MSME Council and uh, CMD of Somani Ceramics. And uh, Mr. Sunil Shet, President of uh, India Myanmar Chamber of Commerce. First of all, a good morning. It's a, and a very warm welcome to all of you. <clears throat> My name is Girish Ramchandran. I am the CII Chair for uh, ASEAN as well as uh, Oceania regions. I'm also, my day job is I, I'm the president of TCS uh, across Asia Pacific. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to have this interaction with, uh, with, with you. And uh, not only does uh, India and Myanmar share a 1600 kilometer border, but we are also tied uh, historically and as well as through cultural and civiliz civilizational ties. So it's only natural that uh, we have uh, important economic and trade linkages as well. And uh, being the bridge connecting India via, via its northeastern states with Southeast Asian countries, Myanmar has a critical element in India's uh, Act East policy. 
<clears throat> border trade between um, India and uh, Myanmar has a significant mm-hmm. role to play from the macroeconomic perspective of uh, regional economic integration between South Asia as well as the Southeast Asia region. India's four states, Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland, and Arunachal Pradesh share international border with uh, Myanmar. And uh, Myanmar is... Uh, economy is projected to grow this year at over 3% uh, following and coming out of uh, COVID, which had an 18% contraction last year. While the overall economic economy has faced headwinds, there has also been some sectors which have stabilized or recovered over the past 12 months. And some firms have reported operating at a higher proportion of their capacity in 2022. Uh, especially in the manufacturing as well as manufactured exports are recovering. Construction activity is also picked up as work on several projects has resumed after a long pause and the pipeline of issued permits have grown. And a rise in mobility at workplaces, retail outlets and transport hubs has also supported overall economic activity. <clears throat> India today, India, uh, Myanmar bilateral trade has increased from 1.3 billion in 2021 to around 1.8 billion. And out of the 1.8 billion trade, 1 billion was uh, India's exports, imports from Myanmar, and 0.89 was India's exports to Myanmar, making India the seventh largest export destination as well as the fourth largest source of imports from Myanmar. So moving forward, I think I just want to talk about some level areas of cooperation which we can, which will get further elucidated in our meeting today. One is obviously building regional supply chains for deeper regional integration. Two, logistics, augmenting logistics and infrastructure because uh, COVID has really exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in global supply chain. <clears throat> and uh, this is a great opportunity for us to see how we can build Sub resilient supply chains um, and, and Im- which can give strategic importance to the Yen- India-Myanmar trade route for international business. Three, uh, Mr. Uh, Somani will agree, accelerating MSME growth through global linkages must form a part of our agenda. Four, another important thing is uh, healthcare and uh, India is a very strong player in pharmaceutical manufacturing <clears throat> and India is also leading exporter to the world and this this category is something which is interesting for both countries and we should look at it fifth i want to talk about energy partnerships in um, especially in renewable energy they can work on biomass power generation which is the most suitable as well as solar and wind energy aiding to myanmar's national electrification plan sixth um, agriculture is a very important mainstay and uh, we have CI strong training facilities for food quality and safety and we can assist in capacity building in Myanmar as well. <clears throat> and finally, um, every business today has become a tech business and digitization is key for it. And uh, beyond the movement of goods and physical connectivity, it is important for India and Myanmar to explore ways to enhance digital connectivity. And India has taken very solid lead in terms of digital infrastructure. And our booming digital economy will actually provide quite advantages for Myanmar to depend upon. So I'm sure this uh, participants of this meet would greatly benefit from the insights of a very, very um, significant number of uh, speakers today. So I would now first like to call uh, Mr. Zomin Bin, President of uh, UMS, to give his uh, address. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Mingalaba, and Excellency Ambassador Mr. Vinay Kumar, and Excellency Ambassador Umu Jao, and Honorable Mr. Kirish Ramachandra, the Chairman of Confederation of Indian Industry National Committee on ASEAN and Oceania. And Honorable Mr. Strickneck Sumani, Chairman of the CII MSME Council. And Honorable Mr. Sanil Seth, the President of Indian and Myanmar Chamber of Commerce. Distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. 
Good day to you all. It is my honor and pleasure to meet you all today. On behalf of UMFCCI representing the private sector of Myanmar, let me express my sincere thanks to the sponsor and organizer, CII, the embassies of India and Myanmar, for allowing us to be part of this Indian Myanmar business meet on this day. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, India is our great friendly neighbors with historical very close relation in culture, people, and trade. Trade and commerce relation between India and Myanmar have been growing the past few years since 1990 with cooperation in all sectors, particularly in those of Indo-Myanmar bilateral trade, both in border and overseas trade, investment and technical fields. Myanmar is one of the largest exporters of pulses and beans to India oh, and other import products such as dry legumes, nuts, India exports mostly pharmaceutical <laughs> products to Myanmar and other main items are raw iron bars and pure cotton yarn. In terms of foreign direct investment in Myanmar, India stands at 11th position in 36 projects with US dollar 775 million, sharing 0.84% in Myanmar total of foreign direct investment, according to the DACA statistic. However, at present, Indo Myanmar bilateral and Indian investments are not corresponding to Indian economic size. Due to several reasons rooted in the past and present, Indo Myanmar trade routes and connectivities are comparatively weak as compared with Sino Myanmar and Myanmar Thai connectivity. We would like to suggest rebuilding connectivities, restoring bridge and road link of Tambukali Mandalay Yango via Myawati Mirta Bangkok by rejoining India with our immediate and extended geographies. Myanmar is the only ASEAN nation with which Indians share both land and maritime borders and therefore is a gateway to Southeast Asia. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives in the past years, and we are even more aware that the pharmaceutical industry and healthcare sectors play a vital role in keeping our good health and ensuring a better quality of life for us. On this note, I would like to remark that Indian pharmaceutical industry contributed not only to the health security, but also to the economic growth of our country. It is important to ensure that our collaboration are in line with the needs of the society and promote a dynamic exchange of opportunity between our business and manufacturers. Yet another opportunity exists in the renewable energy sectors. And our world is more connected than ever. No doubt, India is one of the top global leading country for all installed renewable capacity. In my personal view, Clean energy can have several benefits in terms of environmental, social, and technological advancement. For Myanmar, we still have a way forward in sufficient electrification. As such, electricity insufficiency is one of the most important challenges for our business in Myanmar. So it will be advantageous for Indian's renewable partner to share technology, resources, and investment in Myanmar for effective an efficient cooperation with the view of a win-win situation. Another sector that agriculture, agriculture is the backbone economy of India and Myanmar. It has been practiced in our country for thousands of years. And over a period of time, it has developed a lot. Now in the modern era, the use of technologies and equipment have been replaced in our country. The agriculture evolution not only contributed to the growth of GDP, but also required a large labor force and benefited from high employment. Promoting agriculture innovation to improve productivity in the agri agriculture sector is essential. So I believe strengthening research and development, accelerating knowledge and promoting adoptions of new technologies are the key factors in the industrial expansion in the agriculture sector. Thus, we as the private sector would be keen to explore more opportunities 
to enhance the business collaboration in our businesses. Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, Indo-Myanmar geographically proximity provides a good economic opportunity for market, not only in and for Myanmar, but in and for ASEAN through building strong historical, social, cultural, and economic trade linkages with Myanmar and beyond. As agreed by the CII and UMFTCI MOU framework, we have to work together for shared benefit and prosperity by boosting up broad spectrum of trade, investment, and tourism, and importantly, closer cooperation on digitalizations of trade and commerce and IT technology. Finally, on the final notes, I would like to congratulate and thanks again to the generous host for organizing and making this business meet event possible. I wish you all great success in the event and stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swaminwin, for your comments. Can I now ask uh, Mr. Srikan Somani, Chairman of uh, CII MSME Council and CMD of Somani Ceramics Limited to address all of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jayesh. Uh, um, His Excellency, Mr. Vinay Kumar, Ambassador to of India to Myanmar. His Excellency, Mr. Mo Kyo Ong, Ambassador of Myanmar to India. Mr. Girish Ramachandran, the Chairman and uh, CII National Committee of ASEAN and Oceania Region. And President, Asia Pacific Tata Consultancy Services. Mr. Yu Zong Minvin, President of uh, UMFCCI. Uh, Mr. Sunil Seth, President, India Myanmar Chamber of Commerce. Let me first wish you all a very good morning. Uh, with the onset of uh, the pandemic, I think we are today engaged in a very, we've all learned how to live in the VUCA world. And with the constantly changing geopolitical and e economic scenario in the world interconnected, no country is fully shielded from events and, and, and emanating outside of its political frontiers. This year was a momentous of a year for India where it completed 75 years of its independence to reflect on the learnings from the past and an understanding of the possibilities in the future. With the mission of transforming India into a developed uh, economy in the next 25 years, it is important that the key contributors to the Indian economy are deeply focused for growth through adequate resource fulfillment, fulfillment and newer innovative solutions. Commercial cooperation is the key area of focus. India is the fourth largest source of import from Myanmar, but trade remains below its potential. Agriculture sector dominates bilateral trade. Myanmar is the second largest supplier of beans and pulses to India and timber and wood products. India's export to Myanmar include pharmaceutical products, steel and iron products, electrical machinery, mineral oil, rubber, and articles of plastics, etc. The country's significant mineral deposits, particularly of jade and rubies and natural gas reserves, have drawn international attention. Reforms launched in 2011 including opening up to the trade and investment led to some modest economic gains and a burst of foreign invest investment. By 2019, gross domestic product per capita reached about uh, $1,400, nearly double of what it was in 2008. Donors such as the European Union, Japan and the United States dramatically increased their aid to Myanmar. However, Many of these gains are now being reversed. The pandemic-induced economic downturn and the unrest has had its impact on the economic aspect. Every crisis, therefore, begins and come, uh, comes with an opportunity as well. The recent disruptions to supply chains should push, uh, push us 
to build self-reliance and re resilience by promoting domestic manufacturing of products across the value chain. Myanmar is a key pillar in India's Act East policy as it connects India to the Southeast countries through the Northern, North, Northern Eastern uh, uh, states of Mizoram, Minipur, uh, Manipur, Nagaland, and Arunachal Pradesh. It shares important economic linkages with India and trade along the borders is quite indispensable. I do remember that at one of the recent CII conferences, His Excellency Mo Kyo Ung rightly pointed out that India is, is, is its important neighborhood first policy has been extending on, uh, for all kinds of support to help overcome economic and health challenges in Myanmar. It has been building roads and bridges, schools and healthcare centers in Myanmar under the India-Myanmar Border Area Development Program. The annual grant of $5 million US has elevated the lives of people living in and around 82 villages in Myanmar. India is building a USD 484 Kaladan multimodal transport, a transit transport project that will connect India, uh, India's Kolkata port with Myanmar's Sitwe port, promoting regional connectivity and development as these projects would create in, uh, an employment opportunities in Myanmar, especially in the conflict ridden, uh, ridden Chin and Rakhine provinces. India and Myanmar as nations need to move and think beyond limits. For this, we need to utilize the inherent advantages that MSMEs in India have over, the, over their global uh, competitors. So we are a young population, large domestic market with a growing middle class and a rapidly urbanizing, uh, urbanizing population. Low cost labor, politically stable democratic setup and a government committed to providing better logistics, connectivity, and conducive businesses around uh, environment. India shares uh, in global manufacturing output already puts it in the first top five of the world. We have 63.5 million MSMEs in the country in various industrial fields. And I think this is an opportunity I, uh, for, for the Indian MSMEs to meet and start businesses in Myanmar, both ways, whether it is import or export, or even get, uh, getting technology, which is wherever it is required, as far as my, and, uh, Myanmar MSMEs is concerned. Uh, my, feel, my feeling is that we should get different sections of industries, which like agriculture, textiles, uh, various, uh, uh, real estate, and engineering all together where we can help each other in trying to build a robust trade and collaborative effort uh, with Myanmar. We look forward to this and India and Myanmar should collaboratively work together to realize the true potential between the two nations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Srikant Um, I think you know, we all know the potential which exists between both the countries. So we should try to leverage and see how we can um, move from strength to strength. I now would like to call uh, Mr. Vinay Kumar, Ambassador, His Excellency, Ambassador of India to Myanmar to address all of us. Sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning and uh, Minglava to all the participants of this uh, important uh, conference. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, 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 Confederation of Indian Industry uh, for organizing uh, the, this event and also uh, our uh, deep appreciation uh, to the Ma Union of Myanmar Federation of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, uh, also uh, India Myanmar Chamber of uh, Commerce, my uh, very dear counterpart in New Delhi, uh, uh, Excellency, good morning to you, especially. Uh, I am I'm particularly uh, happy uh, uh, at the timing of uh, uh, this uh, meeting uh, 
uh, I am, of course, talking with uh, a set of people who are deeply involved in trade and business relations between the two countries. Uh, the, so the potential uh, of the trade and uh, the present uh, uh, trade uh, relations, investment uh, uh, and economic cooperation is very well known to uh, all of you. Uh, so I won't uh, talk on uh, uh, the potential uh, or the present status of uh, the, the, the trade. What I plan to uh, touch upon is some of the issues that uh, a, a, a number of uh, 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 business people have uh, uh, you know, contacted us for and for which we have been very engaged in in last uh, last uh, few uh, few months so so the first uh, uh, sector is agriculture uh, it uh, is already a very important uh, uh, sector for uh, bilateral trade and also uh, 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 related to uh, the exports uh, to india of uh, 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 the pulse uh, and other products uh, uh, is Indian exports uh, in agricultural uh, machineries and uh, uh, fertilizers. Uh, the, the sector to focus uh, 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 now is uh, uh, wild seeds and food processing. So a few a couple of months back, I had requested uh, uh, CII, I had uh, sent a communication to circulate uh, within your membership, uh, 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 the companies which are uh, interested in uh, these two sectors of uh, uh, wild production, uh, that is uh, edible oil production, uh, wild seeds exports, and uh, food processing industry. Uh, the, the, the government is uh, uh, willing to allocate uh, 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 land, uh, provide electricity and water connections uh, in an expedited manner for uh, this sector. So that is uh, one uh, very direct takeaway. Take uh, and uh, also uh, related to that is agricultural machineries. Uh, and uh, th there is need uh, to upscale what we are doing, particularly uh, uh, through uh, uh, better service and per perhaps manufacturing uh, 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 units uh, for farm equipment and tractors, etc. Uh, second area uh, is uh, uh, healthcare, uh, pharmaceutical exports. Of course, we already have a share of nearly 38, 40 percent of pharmaceutical market here. There has been some investment. Uh, one, uh, particularly by Jidas Cadilla, is uh, very uh, well known. Uh, we also have uh, a huge. Uh, Potential, uh, not fully, uh, uh, not fully exploited at uh, th this time, in medical tourism, uh, and for that, uh, uh, the membership uh, of uh, uh, CII uh, who are engaged in this sector, it would be useful if they could uh, bring uh, bring a storm and bring about some order <clears throat> uh, 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 in, in uh, uh, healthcare services for which a large number of people uh, uh, are willing to uh, consider India, uh, 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 despite certain challenges of connectivity uh, uh, between, between uh, the two countries, the flights are uh, you know as not as many as one would want uh, to have, and not many as many cities are directly connected also. Uh, but if uh, the service services are made uh, uh, more predictable, uh, if services uh, are, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, are known in advance and uh, people uh, have the uh, uh, certainty that uh, the, the, uh, the, there would be uh, you know, quality services at known and predictable uh, framework, including prices, it would help in that. We uh, are mindful of uh, the current uh, difficulties that uh, uh, companies working in uh, pharmaceutical uh, sector are facing here. Uh, we are uh, uh, organizing in uh, uh, 
in coming uh, weeks, uh, uh, a meeting of the joint working group on health cooperation. And we hope to address some of these issues about regulation and registration of uh, pharmaceutical products, licensing issues uh, that has come up recently, uh, foreign exchange uh, 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 difficulties uh, to, to uh, uh, to the best possible manner under the present uh, uh, situation. Some of uh, 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 our request has been uh, met, uh, uh, one important one being the validity of the import license, which was uh, just a, 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 a two or three months, which has now been extended. So that is uh, something uh, that uh, we'll uh, push in. Uh, uh, and it would also help if uh, there are more uh, uh, companies uh, interested in setting up manufacturing units and use some of uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, provisions, some of the facilities which are available uh, 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 for entry into a larger ASEAN market also. Uh, because uh, uh, what pandemic has shown is that uh, all the countries, uh, while improving upon trade and making the supply chain resilient, are also looking for uh, for uh, domestic manufacturing, domestic capacity building. Uh, that brings me to uh, 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 next uh, uh, item that is power sector. We already have uh, uh, existing uh, cooperation. Uh, there are some supplies of nearly three uh, yeah, megawatt of electricity, which we export to Myanmar through radial lines in Northeast um, states. Uh, yeah, uh, we are working uh, recently in, as a matter of fact, uh, that uh, over this weekend, Friday, Saturday, we had the meeting of joint working groups and uh, uh, joint steering committee uh, led by our power secretary in the field of power cooperation and uh, transmission lines uh, and uh, uh, knowledge sharing, training, capacity building uh, were the issues that were discussed. Uh, there is, uh, however, huge potential uh, for investment uh, in uh, renewable energy. Uh, Myanmar presently uh, uh, has very low uh, uh, percentage uh, of uh, power production through renewables, just barely 1% or so. Uh, and uh, by uh, 2030, uh, the government plans to uh, generate nearly 9% uh, of uh, uh, power uh, uh, through renewables. Uh, so this uh, provides uh, a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for uh, uh, the, the um, uh, companies working in solar uh, energy in particular in India. Now that all of your, uh, many of your members have uh, uh, got uh, a, a cutting edge competitive advantage given uh, the spread uh, uh, of this sector in India, it would be worthwhile to look at uh, investment uh, in, the, uh, in, in uh, this, this sector. Uh, and uh, uh, grid integration uh, under uh, Prime Minister's One Sun, One World, uh, One Grid uh, uh, scheme is something that uh, we would be working on in coming uh, months uh, and years to, to connect Indian uh, grid to Myanmar and further on uh, to, to uh, uh, Thailand. Uh, we, we have... Uh, 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 also uh, uh, yeah, uh, a very useful and necessary uh, area of cooperation that is tourism. Uh, connectivity needs to improve. Uh, and for that, uh, we are looking at possibilities of Udan flights, uh, flights uh, between India and Myanmar under Udan scheme. Uh, uh, so uh, that should provide uh, more connectivity uh, uh, from the northeastern states uh, to, to the cities in, um, in uh, Myanmar. And further on uh, no, uh, to, to uh, the places of pilgrimage, particularly Bodh Gaya, that are very popular here. Uh, there is a plan uh, that the government here is uh, uh, undertaking, that is core banking. Uh, uh, 
despite the stresses on the banking sector in last uh, year and a half, uh, they, uh, there has been interest that has been expressed for cooperation with India in core banking. Uh, so TCS and other companies which are uh, in this sector, uh, they, they have potential market. And uh, uh, I understand that uh, uh, the government finance ministry here is uh, particularly keen uh, to work with Indian companies in core banking. Uh, uh, and uh, IT services uh, in financial sector. Uh, uh, there are some Indian companies, by the way, present here in this uh, sector already. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there is a lot more uh, possible uh, because uh, the use of uh, 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 digital platforms is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, in urban areas is increasing here. Uh, uh, so. Uh, that that is also something that uh, we should look at. Uh, we of course have uh, uh, a, a number of uh, legacy projects: uh, Kaladan Multimodal Transport Corridor, 69 bridges, uh, also Trilateral Highway. Uh, at present, uh, uh, we continue uh, working on all of them. But the good new news is uh, that uh, Sitme Port has been completed. And uh, this port is ready for op operationalization. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 like uh, very last uh, few uh, issues uh, are, are being worked out, uh, and uh, the port is actually ready to uh, start uh, receiving uh, cargo uh, from Yangon also. So, in fact, uh, in uh, very soon we would be. Uh, undertaking uh, uh, that exercise uh, and it should uh, help in uh, uh, the trade uh, not only with uh, with india uh, but with other, any other uh, uh, partner and also inland uh, uh, waterways trade uh, between ports in in myanmar itself uh, so this is uh, uh, an infrastructure which uh, is secular in nature of its use by uh, all all uh, uh, you know traders and uh, commercial entities. Uh, in that, uh, of course, very recently, uh, a port, uh, uh, another port at Yangon has been in, inaugurated. Uh, uh, Mr. Sunil said uh, uh, can brief more on that, and uh, it also helps. Uh, uh, in uh, in uh, connectivity uh, and uh, you know infrastructure development of the country, not only with respect to India, but also for trade with other countries. Uh, 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 between India and Myanmar, we are uh, uh, on the verge of finalizing uh, a, a coastal shipping agreement. Uh, uh, we have exchanged uh, the drafts, and we are very uh, keen. Both the sides are very keen to finalize and sign this. Uh, in in uh, short order, so those of you uh, uh, who uh, have been working uh, 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 through the land border uh, might know that uh, uh, we have already uh, constructed uh, a modern uh, integrated check post at Mori. Uh, but unfortunately, the completion uh, of this uh, ICP co coincided with commencement of COVID uh, and the borders were closed. So uh, uh, it has not been fully uh, uh, functional uh, or utilized. Uh, uh, but now that we are getting out of COVID and uh, borders are uh, reopening uh, gradually, uh, uh, last week we uh, signed a, a new agreement to construct a, uh, a mirror uh, ICP uh, at Tamu, uh, 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 which which uh, uh, would help in uh, land uh, trade also. Given, given the current issues concerning foreign exchange, uh, there have been discussions uh, uh, between the two uh, governments also on uh, trade settlement uh, in uh, Indian rupees. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, uh, though uh, uh, government here uh, wants to uh, uh, do this in the first phase for border trade, uh, uh, border trade between India and Myanmar is very limited. Uh, so, uh, so we would uh, prefer to cover the larger uh, uh, trade under the scheme. Uh, so work is going on uh, in that sector also. 
uh, 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 with uh, the government and also uh, the banking institutions, Indian banks, which are uh, already present in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, as uh, 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 somebody mentioned uh, that, you know, th there are difficulties, there are uh, uh, challenges, uh, uh, but uh, these challenges also offer uh, opportunities and particularly uh, those uh, which uh, those companies, uh, uh, those investors who uh, are able to take uh, uh, risk at this time uh, would uh, uh, have equally uh, uh, higher, uh, you know, returns and benefits, and uh, you know, uh, make uh, 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 a niche for themselves, carve out their own space, uh, which uh, which uh, is good for uh, the business communities and which uh, is good for the people of both the countries. From from our side, uh, the development cooperation, uh, particularly in SME sector, setting up of industrial training centers. Uh, uh, education, uh, investment in education, uh, like uh, information technology, we have uh, 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 equipped and uh, uh, trained uh, uh, staff and faculties uh, at Myanmar Institute of uh, Information Technology in the agricultural sector, uh, you know, advanced center for agricultural research and education has been completed, a rice biofarm has been constructed, uh, and there, uh, there are continuing uh, programs uh, of border area development, which essentially all of it contribute to uh, the local economy, employment generation, and uh, jo job creation. Is something that we will uh, uh, we will continue uh, doing and do in fact uh, uh, with a vigor as per uh, the the requirement. Uh, uh, all of it should uh, uh, you know galvanize you and promote uh, uh, your members uh, uh, and I mean uh, CIA members and also your counterparts in Myanmar uh, to uh, uh, look at some of these fresh uh, opportunities uh, uh, which are on the way. Uh, from uh, the embassy side, I can assure you uh, that we will uh, 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 extend all support uh, uh, to, to make uh, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, feel uh, at home while you do business in India or in Myanmar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for giving very practical issues on the ground and also suggesting some way forward. Thank you very much. Now, can I request uh, His Excellency, Mr. Mo Kya Aung, Ambassador of Myanmar to India, to address all of us. Thank you. Excellency, Mr. Vinay Kumar, India Ambassador to Myanmar, <clears throat> Mr. Girish Raman Chandran, Chairman of CII National Committee on ASEAN and Oceania Region, Uzo Menwen, President of UMSCCI, Mr. Pradeep Bangla, Chairman of CII MSME Council and CMD, Mr. Sunil Seth, President of India Myanmar Chamber of Commerce, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> good morning and minglava. It is my great honor and privilege to participate in India Myanmar Business Meet together with fellow ambassador. Excellency Mr. Vinay Kumar and Chairman of CII, UMFCCI and IMCC. At the outset, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Confederation of Indian Industry, CII, for timely organizing this remarkable virtual meeting to discuss about collaboration opportunities between Myanmar and India. As the two countries are bound by friendly and partnership relations, I am convinced that promotion of trade and investment cooperation and implementation of joint projects in different spheres will bring strengthening our mutual long-term collaboration for our future benefits. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, as you all have known, the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic has hampered the global economy and has brought distancing in physical communication of business and disruption in supply chain of various industries all over the world. Therefore, every country has been trying to mitigate 
and remediate the adverse impact of COVID-19. With the prevailing situation, the economic recovery will take time, but I believe that this situation will also open up new opportunities for Myanmar economy. I am quite op optimistic that with the systematic implementation of the existing relief plan and enhancing cooperation with partner countries, Myanmar will completely overcome the situation. Emphasizing on our cooperation goals, I believe that today's meet is a valuable platform to share the insights and opportunities for doing better business environment between the two countries in post-pandemic era. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, to have ease of doing business, Myanmar has already set the urgent action to ensure for the speedy recovery of business affected by the pandemic. In order to have effective economic recovery at national level, the Working Committee was formed as an institutional mechanism to formulate the short, medium, and long-term measure to respond to the COVID-19 crisis since last year. Myanmar Economic Recovery Plan has been drafted in line with the Sustainable Development Goal, SDG. We establish a special fund for business sectors and also provide expo credit for principal commodity since we take SMEs as the backbone of the economy. In MERP, we have liberalized many measures of green business in Myanmar for new investors. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, we also realize the need to adjust and re-engineer the investment environment of Myanmar, which is to be friendlier with the new normal situation like many countries around the world. In this scenario, Myanmar is mainly focusing on the investment facilitation that will be performed by the five smart programs, streamlining and simplifying procedures, maximizing online services and maximizing barriers, <clears throat> minimizing barriers to business, assuring aftercare services, reducing regulatory burdens and transparency enhancement. Myanmar Investment Commission has approved the standard operation procedure for its one-stop service to facilitate the existing and potential investor in dealing with the government offices. The MIC also announced 50% reduction on service fees from 20th April 2020 to today. It intends to save production costs and other charges incurred by existing and potential domestic and foreign investors during the COVID-19 pandemic period stipulated by the union. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, in order to support the economic recovery of the country due to the COVID-19 crisis, the Myanmar Investment Commission particularly prioritized six sectors as a measure of investment promotion, namely, reduction of value-added agriculture, livestock, and fishery sectors, which can connect to the lower value chain, healthcare services, establishment of industrial zones and related businesses, digital-based enterprise, infrastructure development project, green economy, and renewable energy projects. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, against this backdrop, I would like to take this opportunity to brief on Myanmar-India bilateral trade and investment relation. India is ranked sixth position among Myanmar trade partners. In the fiscal year of 2021, the bilateral trade volume stands at US dollar 1.4 billion. The export from Myanmar to India amounted to US dollar 873 million, while the import from India was US dollar 587 million. Myanmar mainly export beans and pulses, veneer, plywood, and rubber, etc., to India, and main import items from India are pharmaceutical products, iron and steel material, and chemical, etc. Even though the countries share a long land border, India is only the 11th largest investor in Myanmar. I learned that India's growing marketplace 
has a demand on agricultural products and meanwhile, Myanmar is keen to expand its export in terms of quality and quantity as well as the varieties. I believe that Myanmar's very added agricultural production and livestock sector has much potential for Indian investor. We seek for India's investment much more in the area of agriculture, infrastructure, education, healthcare, digital train, training, skill and research to support harness and cope with the global changes. Myanmar MSMEs are also seeking technical know-how and capital investment. We welcome the investment activities such as the establishment of industrial zone, the supply chain for the agricultural sector, health-related manufacturing, and digitization. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to integration process, it is evident that geographical proximity, strong cordial political and cultural linkages pave the way for greater economic integration between ASEAN and India. Since the government of India has laid down the Act East policy, it is now implementing through the northeast region of the country as a gateway to the Southeast Asia. I am confident that being a neighborhood, Yama is best positioned to play a crucial role in bridging India and other Southeast Asian countries for closer economic ties. Taking this opportunity, I would like to invite India investor to explore potential economic activities and to take further steps in doing business in Myanmar. I am also convinced that today's business dialogue will stimulate on the long-term cooperation of the two businesses between both sides, as well as bring the existing mutual friendship and share understanding between our two countries. I wish today Myanmar India business meet have a success and beneficial. And again, I congratulate the organizer for your great effort in hosting this most fruitful dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Um, <clears throat> you clearly elucidated the opportunities which exist, and we will also look at how we can try to look at uh, bringing some investors from India to in Myanmar. Your point is well taken. Thank you very much. Now, to close this particular session, I would like to invite Sunil, uh, Sunil Sethi, uh, ex-colleague from, from Tata Group. And Sunil, pleasure to see you. And uh, uh, please uh, give your close, uh, uh, comments on, you, you, are the, you are the person on the ground. You spent a significant amount of time in Myanmar. Love to hear from you on your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Girish. Uh, lovely to connect with you after a long time. Uh, Ambassador Vinay Kumar, uh, Ambassador Mojo Ong, uh, Uzawin Min, a good friend from UMFCCI, uh, Girish, uh, Mr. Somani, and I would really like to make a, a special mention to welcome uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay. I know he's on the uh, session here and he's an old friend and many of us uh, attending the meet today uh, have worked closely with him. Uh, so welcome all and uh, really very uh, excited and happy uh, that along with UMFCCI and IMCC uh, and uh, CII, we were able to hold this very significant meet, which we've been planning for quite some time. Uh, I think I've, all the speakers have uh, put their points across. And as Girish mentioned, yes, I have been in this country for about 10 years first for five years representing the Tata group and for the last five years uh, with the Adani group. Uh, so my, I, I don't have a prepared speech, but I would just like to make a four very broad points uh, for the consideration of, of everyone here. The first important point I want to make is that, you know, Myanmar was a country which was closed for, you know, over 50 years. And since 2012, it opened up, but it is still for a lot of Indian business people, a kind of a black box. The way you understand Singapore or Hong Kong or Thailand, probably you don't understand Myanmar. And that's, that's not surprising. That is something and that we all know. In the last five years, we've established a very strong platform in IMCC, the India-Myanmar Chamber of Commerce. And we work very closely with the Indian Embassy, uh, as well as with UMFCCI, 
So all that I want to communicate to all the Indian business people who are interested to look at either a trading relationship or an investment relationship with Myanmar is that you have a very strong you know, platform, uh, a strong uh, organization in Myanmar, which can help you find the right partners. You know, that's a big thing which I remember people used to face that how do, you know, if I want to potentially identify an area, how do I get the right partner to move forward? I think that is something that you should be very comfortable that we have a very strong secretariat at IMCC. We have about 150 members now. The who's who of India and Myanmar are members of IMCC, whether it's MSMEs or big organizations like, you know, ONGC, Gale, NTPC, Adani's or the Tata's. So I think that's something which I would like to park here. And I quite agree with uh, uh, the point made by uh, speakers. I think it's high time and we'll discuss that with both Ambassador uh, Vinay Kumar as well as with uh, Ambassador uh, Mojo Ong to see how we can now really take a business delegation. You know, we really want some business people from Myanmar to travel to India, meet up with people in, you know, whether it is in Bangalore, in, in Mumbai or Delhi, and face-to-face -face meet and understand what India has to offer. One is to do a Zoom call. The other is because of COVID, unfortunately, we were not able to do that. But I would very, very certainly want uh, this to be done. And we'll take the help of uh, CII. And between us, the embassies and UMFCCI, see how we can really make this happen. Because to me, to my mind, that will be uh, something which will really make a change because seeing is believing. The second point I want to make is, and I think Ambassador Vinay Kumar made that important point, is looking at the current conditions uh, in Myanmar of you know, shortage of uh, foreign currency and US dollars, and with India already having a trade of $2 billion, I think it's very, very important that this idea of a rupee trade be pushed quite you know, in a very aggressive manner. I think we've been speaking about it for quite some time, but I think between uh, the embassies, between the ministries of finance, as well as between the Central Bank of Myanmar and RBI, maybe we really need to put a very, very focused and an assertive attempt to see how this can really come down to doing something. When China, uh, there's been some progress in China, in, in you know, yuan trade, as well as in Thai baht. So why can't India do that? So that is something which I would strongly like to park and see how, you know, amongst all the participants, we can really do this to make this. And that, to my mind, will also be a game changer and will make a lot of difference because uh, you know this is a reality which we all have to face. And if rupee trade, and as Ambassador mentioned rightly, the border trade is hardly $90 million, which is nothing. The total trade is $2 billion, and that is what we really need to uh, focus on. The third point I want to make is that, uh, again, Ambassador did mention about that on connectivity. So you know, till now, the as far as exports of a billion dollars are concerned, it is primarily agro products. And to me, as long as the policies remain stable on between India and Myanmar in terms of you know importing beans and pulses from from Myanmar to India, you know you always have cargo available monthly. And for a shipping company, that's a huge attraction that you know this I have cargo to take material from Myanmar to India. However. There is a nearly a 800 to 900 million dollar export from India to Myanmar, but the challenge there is that these, this it's a very fragmented cargo, unlike a very consolidated beans and pulses cargo which is available for on the export side. On the import side, it's very fragmented. So whether it's automobiles, whether it is you know steel rods, whether it is pharmaceutical, whether it's garment raw material, it has to. So the challenge there, and I think that's the other project which we should really take between. Uh, us, I meaning UMFCCI, IMCC, and CII, is to see, work with the Indian businesses and see how we can consolidate the export cargo from India at a few hubs. Ambassador also mentioned about Sitwe, and also I'm very happy to say that the, the first private sector Indian container terminal is now fully operational in Yangon. And you know, Indian businesses should really leverage that to see how we can do direct sailing between Myanmar and India and avoid transshipments at Port Kalang or Singapore, which helps the businesses to cut down their working capital needs and to get material much faster. To me, this again will be a game changer. And that is something that we consciously need to take as a project and work, to work together. My last point is, and I think a lot of people mentioned, I would just like to reiterate, I think Mr. Somani mentioned about you know, MSMEs, Girish mentioned, everyone. 
So I think, and I think the, um, both the ambassadors also, and Ms. Uzovin Min also identified. So I would really encourage, uh, you know, MSMEs uh, from India to seriously look at renewable. Renewable is something that renewable energy and solar, and India has that expertise, but, uh, but the kind of plants Myanmar is looking at is, is not 100 megawatts. They are looking at 20 to 30 megawatts at multiple locations. So there, I know there are many Indian companies who would be interested in this business. So that is something that I would like to park and say that, please have a look at this. Edible oil is a huge requirement for Myanmar because you know that, that's a huge import item and with foreign exchange constraints, if someone wants to put up a small uh, refinery or something on edible oil and, and food processing, I think that would be good. And the, and the last one is, of course, healthcare, where today people go to Bangkok or to Singapore for treatment. Why not India, which is so close by, we can uh, provide that. So these are four broad points that I wanted to park with you. I think we, we have, we've lined up some good sessions on pharmaceutical, agro uh, going forward. And I think most important is not just Zoom, but as the COVID situation comes under more control, I think we should soon uh, make, a, make a visit for both business delegations. So all the best and, and, and thank you very much. Uh, God bless. Thank you uh, Sun, for that uh, four interesting points and how we can improve the trade. I really want to thank uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Vinay Kumar, Your Excellency, Mokya Ong, as well as uh, <coughs> Mr. Zomin Win, as well as uh, Srikant Somani for your insights in this particular session. We will take all your points across and see how we are able to act on all of this. Um, I want to conclude this session by thanking everybody for their contribution and thanking everybody who has been in this, in this, um, in this session. I now would like to go on to the, uh, pass on the patent to the next session, <clears throat> which is, um, uh, we have the plenary session on business continuity in current times, collaborate for ongoing trade, and uh, would like to invite uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay before I uh, pass on the baton to Ambassador, maybe I'll just take a few minutes to uh, talk about him. Ambassador Gautam Mukhapadhyay joined the Center for Policy Research as a senior visiting fellow in June 2019, after a career in the Indian Foreign Service, during which he served in various capacities in Indian embassy, in embassies and missions in Mexico, Cuba, France, as well as the United Nations. Um, the Ministry of Defense at India, and eventually as India's ambassador to Syria, Afghanistan, and Myanmar from 2013 to 2016. He also reopened the Indian Embassy in Kabul in November 20, 2001 as, uh, as a charged affairs after the ouster of the Taliban in Afghanistan in November 2001. Ambassador Mukhopadhyay's uh, current interests include Afghanistan and Myanmar, uh, India's Act East policy, and regional cooperation among South and Southeast Asia with a focus on Northeast of India on which he hopes to simulate some policy work at the center. His other current affiliations include an association with uh, Niti Aayog uh, for Niti, Niti Forum for the Northeast as an advisor and chair of the CII task on economic ties with Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, as well as Vietnam. Mukhopadhyay's uh, diplomatic career has been very notable for the range of his professional experience, covering media, culture, human rights, uh, development, defense, as well as security. He graduated from Delhi University with a bachelor's in history and a master's in sociology. And he's an alumni of the National Defense College of India and also has also worked at the UN headquarters in New York as a consultant on social development and as a visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. Um, his current interest, uh, ex extracurricular activities include Indian and world music and travel with a special focus uh, in interest in the uh, in Northeast of India as well as Southeast Asia. Um, thank you, Your Excellency, for taking this se session as a, as a moderator. Welcome you to this session. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Girish Ramachandran, for that very, uh, very exhaustive uh, uh, introduction of me. Uh, good morning, Minglaba to everyone. A special uh, greeting to the two ambassadors, Ambassador Vinay Kumar and Ambassador Mojo Ong. Uh, guests, participants, both from um, 
uh, India as well as Myanmar. And of course, a special thanks to uh, Sunil Seth, uh, an old friend, and also for his very warm words in the last session. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all and to all our other uh, participants and guests who are joining us now to the second session of this India-Myanmar business uh, meet. Uh, my heartfelt congratulations to the CII and its partners, the IMCC, uh, and the two embassies uh, for organizing this uh, event. And as I think Ambassador Vinay Kumar said, uh, it's the timing of it that is of, um, of, 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 you know, of, of great interest. Um, I think we've all been very hugely enlightened uh, by the first session uh, in which um, I think all the speakers uh, identified a number of key areas uh, in key areas of opportunity in the uh, you know B two B trade between uh, Myanmar and India, uh, as well as some of the key problems and the efforts that are being made to uh, to overcome them. Uh, and I took take at the end, you know, Sunil Seth's uh, uh, very um, sort of positive uh, four points uh, that he made. But just for our participants who are joining us right now. Uh, I will just quickly sort of uh, run over, I think, some of the areas that were mentioned and perhaps mention one or two that would also be considered. And amongst them, starting with Mr. Ramachandran himself, were things like logistics infrastructure, of course, the pharma and health industries, that's uh, already a strong pillar uh, and uh, remains you know, uh, an important area. A lot of people spoke about renewable energy, uh, everybody spoke about agriculture, um, and I think Ambassador also spoke about both agricultural machinery, as well as, I think, very, very importantly, and I would like to really highlight this, uh, the prospects in oil seeds and in food processing in general, uh, because um, that's a very underdeveloped area uh, in Myanmar. Uh, he also mentioned prospects in uh, medical tourism, uh, once again, Mr. Sumani and others talked about uh, the scope for digitization and the digital economy, digital platforms. Uh, the two ambassadors spoke about, uh, you know, building greater connectivity. Uh, Mr. Sumani, I think, also highlighted um, the particular sort of um, scope and uh, for the medium and small uh, enterprises in Myanmar. And that's something that I would like to also underline. And also medium and small enterprises precisely uh, in some of these areas like agriculture, uh, where a large part of, um, you know, uh, Myanmar's livelihoods uh, depend on uh, and where there is a great scope for processing and adding value and also creating employment, uh, if not also generating entrepreneurship uh, and partnership between the two countries. So I think these were some of the areas that were uh, were covered uh, in, in the morning session. And there is one area that was uh, not perhaps covered, but I also would like to add, uh, which is, you know, the potential of education, both um, uh, perhaps inside uh, Myanmar, but uh, particularly, I would say, outside Myanmar. Uh, India is a strong education destination. It's an English language education destination. Uh, it's a destination where a lot of uh, business uh, type of education can also be extended, business related, chartered accountancy uh, and so on. Uh, so with those words, um, I would, uh, you know, like to quickly introduce our uh, panelists for, for this morning. Uh, and we are lucky to have actually a panel of three outstanding experts, uh, beginning with uh, Mr. Min Nang Wu, uh, Managing Director of Allen and Gledhill Myanmar and a partner of Allen and Gledhill uh, overall with extensive experience on advising in banking, finance, mergers, acquisitions, infrastructure, uh, corporate and commercial uh, arbitration and competition. And he has previously been the chief executive officer of the Singapore International Arbitration Center and director at the uh, uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry of, of Singapore. Um, uh, he is one of he's our uh, first part uh, uh, panelist. Our second panelist will be Mr. Rikesh Chand, uh, General Manager of Exim Bank of India. Uh, Mr. Rikesh Chand also has uh, more than 25 years of work experience, 18 of them in the Exim Bank in different uh, uh, functions. Um, he is currently spearheading one of the bank's flagship programs, the Buyer's Credit 
under the national export insurance account and i hope he can bring how that could perhaps uh, play a role uh, in our b2b trade uh, he's also headed the bank special operations group uh, uh, and, and also the bank's office in dubai in the past and our third panelist again is a person of extensive uh, legal and business experience in in the area of consultancy uh, nishant choudhury partner uh, myanmar uh, you know managing managing director myanmar and head of the regional dispute resolution uh, uh, practice so without further ado let me invite uh, or address my first question to mr uh, minnangu uh, and that is given your long experience uh, of working uh, in with myanmar uh, and particularly from singapore what do you think are some of the areas where indian companies can play a significant role in investing and contributing to the ongoing bilateral trade in the current post covid uh, uh, situation um, and the, in the current environment thanks thanks very much uh, ambassador and uh, thanks thanks very much for the for the question uh, ambassador and 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 for um, the very kind introduction um, and 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 a very good morning or afternoon to to everyone um the the i i think you know what the, the covid has taught us and i think the title of um, of our panel session uh, being business continuity uh is that um in we we need to be prepared uh and 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 to look at where um you can make a difference while ensuring that you know you can carry on uh even if um if if a pandemic uh, hits uh like 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 covid did so and in that sense i think you know some of the areas where i think indian companies are strong um and can contribute i think you know to the um to to the economy in myanmar and to helping the people of myanmar uh or have already been mentioned but uh, let me just mention them again um you mentioned yourself education ambassador and i think that's that's very, that's very important um uh, and although you say well you know with an emphasis on education uh in india i think uh if india can bring high level uh, education institutions um uh, to to help the people uh the the young people of myanmar i think that would be very beneficial for the long term development uh of the people and and the country and i would also like to i think um mention the area of manufacturing and i and, and by manufacturing i mean uh it could be every related uh, given myanmar's uh, uh given myanmar's strength um, in in the agriculture sector but also uh things like pharmaceutical uh manufacturing uh because again like uh what i started off with you know as covid has taught us i mean if you can have uh medication in the country uh then you know it it would help uh, uh deal with uh, situations that that um, health situations that would arise and it would also create employment um and also uh i think with a manufacturing base in uh, myanmar which is an asean country and this is something that uh, uh might be relevant for i think indian companies that want to penetrate the wider asean market um asean myanmar being a member of asean has uh has has a membership in all of the uh, asean uh free free trade agreements that um, that have been signed and and that gives uh tariff free access uh, in many cases uh to several um, uh, important markets so that's something again that i think you know uh, indian companies wishing to penetrate um, the asean market uh you know through the asean economic community and 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 beyond through the asean ftas uh, can can consider so manufacturing because of the employment opportunities um uh, having uh, things made in you know in country uh, helping helping the the people as and when you know uh, especially you know having gone through covid we realize it's important uh, to when when borders are closed uh, to have that uh, resource um and and of course i think you know the last point uh, on energy i i think you know it's it's done undeniable that uh, you know that's that's a need that um, uh uh drives um, in you know many things right uh, uh people's lives in general um in, in industry uh, just uh, living in uh, uh rural areas or um, you know that that might not uh that 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 may not be plugged into the grid as as, as much uh as as easily uh so so i think again that's an area where where um, indian companies uh have have a strength uh, uh and and scale that 
can can be helpful in uh, um, contributing to to to, to Myanmar. So those those would be, I think, some of the areas that um, Indian companies may want to look at. Right. Um, thank you very much, Ben Nangu. Um, let me actually now turn to Nishant. Um, you know, to sort of actually uh, extend uh, uh, what you started with, uh, and ask him to give us an overview of the legal framework for investment in Myanmar, uh, particularly since some of the uh, speakers and you yourself have also talked about investment in the manufacturing sector and other sectors as well. So the legal framework for investment in Myanmar, uh, a point that you made very strongly was that investment in Myanmar also opens uh, up the entire ASEAN uh, free, trade uh, free trade market, uh, the co ASEAN common market, as well as the free trade agreements that they have. Um, and can you also, in the process, provide us an idea of the regulatory regime and some of the key points to take note of, um, with a special mention for the pharmaceutical industry, because particularly if you want investment, and of course, there have been some difficulties of late, uh, if you could address those difficulties as well. Uh, Nishant? Thank you, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, and uh, appreciate your kind introduction of myself. Uh, good morning, the panelists. and other esteemed uh, members of today's uh, audience. Uh, primarily, I would start off by saying that amongst all other jurisdictions, it is likely Indian businesses which should be more comfortable with legal regime in Myanmar, given our historical uh, background. Given both Myanmar and India stem from, uh, or at a time, in fact, identical legal framework, whereby India progressed uh, with certain developments as the market evolved, and Myanmar, though slow, is still evol evolving uh, to a larger extent. <clears throat> so that's the preface. In fact, to date, Indian judgments are pretty much persuasive uh, in, in courts in Myanmar uh, as compared to uh, other locations amongst the common law countries. Now, let's, let's distinguish two forms of investments. Either we talk about uh, cross-border trade, uh, or we talk about strategic investments in the country. And I'll, I'll briefly first touch upon trade because a, a fair bit of uh, Indian business uh, with Myanmar delves around trading activities as compared to uh, investments on ground in Myanmar. Now, we understand that a fair bit of trading which is happening uh, between India and Myanmar are cross-border. Uh, historically, there were certain embargoes on, on foreigners uh, being allowed to trade in Myanmar, which was uh, lifted uh, in 2019, 18 and 19. And in fact, now foreigners are allowed to establish their onshore uh, wholesale and or trading establishment, though it's basically brick and mortar. Uh, uh, and, and there are policies being evolved and, and under discussions for e-commerce as well. Uh, so basically, you know, rather than uh, spending through uh, intermediaries to be able to sell your products onshore in Myanmar, uh, companies from India can basically establish themselves onshore as a wholesaler and or a retailer and be able to uh, sell their products without having to manufacture in the country, subject to certain capital injections, which is necessary as per the regulations. Now, moving on to the strategical investments, onshore manufacturings, because those have been uh, the point of discussions, uh, starting with what you had highlighted, Mr. Mukhopadhyay, and what Min touched upon. Uh, Myanmar has, has brought about certain very important policy changes. Uh, to, to highlight is the company's law, which is very modern, uh, uh, very uh, sophisticated, uh, has implemented online registry. So basically you can establish your company within a period of uh, two to three days. Uh, as touched upon by uh, uh, one of the uh, panelists in the, in the previous session, uh, the other big achievement on the policy framework is Myanmar investment law, uh, which provides for a single window clearance uh, uh, for any investor into the country. Uh, incentives are large. So basically, depending upon the location where you have uh, established your, your, your uh, company or your factory, uh, 
and if you're under the priority sector, you do get tax in incentives that is tax-free, corporate tax-free exemption for a period ranging from three years to seven years. You get accelerated depreciations and there are so many other incentives like land right authorizations for a long-term basis, et cetera. Most important to know, it will be seen very rarely in investment laws that the sovereign of a country guarantees in the law itself against expropriation. So the Myanmar investment law as uh, you know, enacted has a guarantee against expropriation and if it's necessary under certain benchmarks, a fair market value is also promised under the law. Now that is a very robust safeguard with respect to investors in the country. There are other regimes also in place. So there is a special economic zone, uh, zone law where there are these uh, designated special economic zones where similar investments can take place, has similar tax benefits. Depending upon which zone you come from or you have established your business into, you also get Myanmar market, at least on the wholesale front, to be able to sell your products while manufacturing in the SCC. So to sum it up, I, I, uh, I'm of the view that Myanmar does have uh, a very uh, attractive, uh, if I would say, uh, policy development uh, over the past uh, seven to eight years uh, since it opened up in, in 2013. And I think so uh, there, is a, there is a substantial amount of uh, legal safeguards and frameworks uh, granted to the, to the investors in the country to be able to come and invest in, and, and uh, work towards development of Myanmar and also to, uh, for the benefit of their stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nishant, for I think highlighting both the common uh, legal yeah. framework as well as the uh, safeguards that have been extended uh, under the kind of investment law and uh, other opportunities. Um, so I'll actually now turn to Mr. Rikesh Chan. Uh, Mr. Rikishan, with your extensive experience uh, in the in the Exim Bank um, uh, and uh, uh, also in issues like sort of buyer's credit and uh, I suppose other forms of credit as well, including G2G credit, what do you see are some of the opportunities and issues for Indian companies in Myanmar? And while I ask that, can I also ask you, uh, we have a fairly robust or we've had a fairly robust government to government credit. What is the scope for buyer's credit or seller's credit um, uh, in good conditions or in you know uh, not so good conditions? Good. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. And uh, thank you, Mr. for a kind introduction. So before I uh, get on the questions, I would like to I would like to tell you the brief background. What has happened so far? So, so far, Indian, Indian companies by way of <clears throat> sorry, loans or equity, they have invested close to $700 million in uh, Myanmar. So far, this is from 96 to 2021. So there is definitely a huge potential, that, but that has been not tapped. But at the same time, government of India is fully committed to increase the bilateral trade. And uh, in fact, uh, government of India has taken many initiatives. One of them is like uh, BIMSTEC, that is Way of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, uh, which has been joined by Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Bhutan, and Nepal. And Myanmar is a signatory to the BIMSTEC, and thereby they are increasing their trade, uh, trade agreement. They are, they are increasing their trade with uh, India, and vice versa, we can also increase the, our trade with uh, Myanmar. Then another, another uh, cooperation is Mekong Ganga Cooperation. That is also an initiative of six countries, that is India and five other ASEAN countries like Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam for cooperation in the field of tourism, education, cultural, transport, and communication. So definitely there are, both governments are committed to increase the bilateral trade, and these are the cooperation. And then of course, India has got ASEAN-India cooperation also, where Myanmar is the only ASEAN country which share a land border with India and as a bridge between India and Southeast Asian market. So, uh, in fact, there is a duty-free trade preference and ASEAN-India trade in goods agreement are the two policy frameworks for India-Myanmar normal trade through the land border. So there is a free trade agreement. Now, coming to the, uh, before I get into the buyer's gate, uh, uh, I would like to give some more uh, colors to the this uh, bilateral uh, trades. So why Myanmar is important for us? First of all, it's a gateway for ASEAN. 
There are 10 countries in ASEAN which have a close to economic size of 2.3 trillion. So it's a huge immense potential. And if you see the region seeks to achieve a single market and production base from where we can penetrate other markets, like India cannot do anything directly with the China, but if you go through the ASEAN market through Myanmar, we can easily tap those markets also. And coming to the, of course, for Indian, Indian, Indian businessmen, there is a access to moderate market where consumerism is growing 55 million population, which is a golden opportunity for the companies seeking in road into the frontier market. From personal care to food and beverage to smartphones, all are, I mean, these are the products which can go to this market. I was just listening to the previous uh, conversation where the, some of the speakers were talking about the renewable energy, solar plants, then edible oil, medical tourism. But apart from that, what we feel, India is exporting close to 35% of its total export to Myanmar by way of pharmaceutical products. But there are also potential for the two wheelers and three wheelers. We feel this is an analysis done by uh, Exim Bank, where we feel a young labor force with a high two wheeler, three wheeler ownership, uh, high two wheeler ownership promises a potential. If you see, Myanmar is highly dependent on two wheelers as a mode of transport and account for more than 80% of their automobile market. So definitely there is a market for two wheelers. And of course, for the three wheelers also, which can be this tuk tuk concept, what they have in their country can be replaced by three wheelers manufacturers in India, like Bajaj and uh, so many others. Then of course, uh, everybody knows how India has penetrated the African market in terms of the mobile accessibility. We can try to replicate the same thing in Myanmar also. Indian companies can go into these countries also, uh, in Myanmar also. And in fact, now I think Myanmar has opened up and there are two foreign service providers also where the Indian company can also look for that. Then coming to, of course, infrastructure. So cement is one of the segment where a lot of infrastructure uh, scope is there in Myanmar, a lot of intercity connectivity, road, hydropower dams, and new hotels and resorts are being made in these countries. And of course, uh, demand is one of the key, uh, cement is one of the key, key uh, material which can be exported from India. And even Indian company can put up a plant there. Then of course, uh, it is, Myanmar is estimated to have half of all the, half of the world's natural tea, which can be used by the Indian companies in the timber manufacturing. And a few in Indian companies have already gone, but I think it can be scaled up uh, very well. And then, of course, education sector and medical tourism has been already talked about. But one, one more important product, uh, which I feel or Exim Bank feel, is dairy product. A lot of dairy product they are importing from New Zealand and Australia, whereas India is just just, I mean, never state where immense, I mean, these products are available. So this is one of the, I mean, industry where the Indian companies can think of putting up some plant or exporting from here. So these are the broad uh, things which can be exported from India and uh, Indian company can set up their plants to, to cater to the local market. But coming from, uh, apart from this, of course, apart from this, there is a buyer's credit uh, facility also. So one is lines of credit, which is G to G that we don't have any role to play, but there is a there is a bias rate under NEIA, which I am heading. So unfortunately, under a to in present scenario, Myanmar is not falling under that category because there is a list of countries where we can extend this thing and it has to be extended to the government only. Only thing we are getting an insurance from NEIA, that is National Export Insurance Account, which is administered by ECGC. We take insurance here and we extend the loan to the overseas uh, government for their projects and in the condition is it has to be built up by the Indian company and 75% export should happen from India. But unfortunately at this point of time that facility is not available for the Indian companies in Myanmar, but there is another, another product called buyer's credit, short term buyer's credit. So under short term buyer's credit, it's a purely on commercial terms. We can definitely look for Indian companies, be it for trading, be it for manufacturing, if they are putting up some plant in Myanmar or they're exporting from India to Myanmar or so in that case, we can extend the funding to Indian companies based on their Indian strength. Like if the Indian company is very good and they are putting up a, some subsidy kind of setup in Myanmar, we can extend the facility to the subsidy company based on the comfort from the Indian company. So this is one of the very good products which a lot of Indian companies are using uh, wherever they have opened up their subsidies or joint venture. And they're taking, taking short term funding from Exim Bank. So there, uh, this is one product where we can come into the picture. So this is all about from this. I think, sir, you are on mute. Uh, Ambassador, you are on mute. Sorry, I, something happened. 
so thank you very much, Mr. Rikishan. I think that was a very comprehensive answer. Uh, I've picked up two or three points which I'd like to come back to you in the next round, but I just want to flag it right now so that you can think about it. Um, uh, you know, you also made the point about the ASEAN market. Uh, so I'd like us, you to follow up a little in terms of what the Exim Bank is actually doing to uh, expand our investment, um, especially in the LDCs, and that includes uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of looking at that large 2.3 uh, billion uh, ASEAN market. Also, you mentioned about the DFTP, the duty free trade preparation, uh, trade preference uh, scheme. I think that could be a huge, actually, uh, engine. Uh, for investment uh, under good conditions. So uh, if there's anything you could enlighten in terms of what is happening through the DFTP uh, mechanism. The question on two and three, two and three wheelers. In fact, it's a puzzle for me why in a country like Myanmar where something like this should be very badly needed has, uh, you know, this item has not picked up. At one stage, we started with Tata Motors, uh, you know, with the Nano. And I think that too, uh, after a period of time, fizzled out. So perhaps any um, panelist later can address why and how this whole thing about the two and three wheelers uh, hasn't uh, picked up. And I think your other points also about construction, dairy, cement, mobile accessibility, all, all very sort of relatively new points in the discussion today. So I, I uh, welcome them. Um, let me now come back to you, um, uh, Nangu. Uh, and steer the discussion a little away from, uh, you know, the kind of opportunities uh, as well as some of the legal, you know, sort of framework that we have been discussing, which of course I'll come back to with Nishan. Uh, but um, also ask you, uh, in the current context, what can the two business chambers or various business chambers, in fact, uh, there are several business chambers on both sides, what role can business chambers, um, uh, um, you know, play uh, in contributing to a better dialogue, better awareness of each other. Um, Sunil talked about moving back, moving back to face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, how would you structure kind of business promotion uh, relationship uh, through the chambers? That's an excellent question, uh, Ambassador, and thank, thank you for it. Um, I, I think the business chambers play a very important role uh, in in, in, in helping to help in, in helping to ensure that companies on both sides understand what the opportunities are uh, in, in both markets as well as in the region uh, in Southeast Asia and, and and also to you know to see how they can learn from each other uh, and, and to collaborate um, not not just uh, in terms of trading right um, but really in terms of other other things like um, uh, technology, uh, trans, uh, sharing, sharing of uh, know-how, um, expertise um, among amongst people, uh, etc. And 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 I think you know, uh, given that uh, now we can travel again, uh, certainly face-to-face -face meetings uh, will be very helpful, um, and 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 face-to-face -face, uh, events uh, will be very helpful. And you know, it it there's nothing like. Um, uh, having having a person uh, sitting in front of you uh, or, or, or holding a product in your hand and, and seeing how it looks and feels and you know uh, maybe even if it makes sounds hearing it uh, right so so I think that's that's important and I remember you know when you were ambassador in Myanmar you know we did that uh, conclave I thought that was a very uh, a very useful uh, event uh, to to bring people together um, and and to also showcase you know what each site can can offer so I think with CII, with the UMFCCI, with the IMCC, uh, now being able to gear up and and and, and organize uh, events like uh, again, uh, it, it it will be very helpful. Uh, and Sunil mentioned bringing Myanmar businesses, uh, businessmen over uh, and and women, you know, to to India. And I think that that um, would would be would be an excellent idea actually uh, to to get people to um, to see for themselves what opportunities uh, for collaboration there might be. So. Um, it trade missions, uh, events where, uh, firstly, right, and, and, and events where people can come together to, to showcase their, their, their product services uh, and have business matching meetings. Um, and, and, you know, in, in, in general, I suppose if also if we can go to regional meetings, that would be, be very good. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Min Nangu. In fact, uh, a question that sort of puzzled me is 
that you know our trade has been at this 1.5 to 2 billion now for several years and uh, in fact we seem to be a little stuck within that 2 billion kind of um, you know mark and uh, may if i may may i just ask you a follow up question uh, how do we get out of this uh, bottleneck at 2 billion <laughs> Well, wow. <laughs> if I knew that. <laughs> well, uh, I think Nishant is willing to help you out. So <laughs> let me turn to him. Uh, but while I'm turning to him, let me also ask him a follow-up question on the legal issues. You know, what are some of the legal issues that companies actually are currently facing both ways uh, for business continuity uh, in trade between India and, and Myanmar? But and of course, I... feel free to answer. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, so feel free to answer. answer so, so sorry, sorry, Ambassador. I mean, um, go ahead, go please, ahead. please carry on. I, 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 you know, as a, as a partial no, no. answer to your question, I guess um, uh, one of the things that I think you know chambers can do is perhaps to hold uh, you know not 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 events and and, and missions as I mentioned earlier, but uh, also to have regular dialogues uh, between them to understand you know the um, the the issues or the and, and the regulations that may change from time to time uh, that uh, companies from each side may face, and and this can be sort of you know at uh, between the the leaderships or the or the or the experts uh, from from the chambers uh, and 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 they can do this uh, regularly and that might be helpful uh, and it might even help to bring the uh, the volumes up okay thank you uh, nishant i think i've already asked my question i don't need to certainly, repeat it certainly you please to address yeah. you know anything sure. any of the issues that i've raised with anyone feel free to address any of them thank you certainly mr uh, you know ambassador mukhopadhyay and in fact the follow-up question and the question directly posed to me complements each other. And uh, because uh, a trade, as you said, has been stagnant and has, has plateaued uh, at, at some level since, since past several years, uh, primarily also means there are some challenges which has led to that stagnancy as far as trade is concerned. And I would say one important aspect is infrastructural. And second is uh, policy roadblocks, which the two countries have not been able to mitigate. Uh, Ambassador Vinay Kumar touched upon certain good news, which, which we uh, just heard while he was speaking about uh, Sitwe port uh, being uh, you know, fully operational now. However, the entailing agreements uh, for the maritime direct uh, you know, uh, trade between India and, and Myanmar is still to be implemented and, and both the sovereigns are deliberating upon that. So I believe that does bring about efficacy that does uh, leave out the intermediaries which were basically uh, expensive, if I would say, and, and, and thus an impediment as far as uh, efficacy of the trade is concerned. We do have uh, the border uh, trade, but it's, it's not very significant if I compare it to the maritime trade. And uh, we understand uh, there are two res uh, respective points where uh, these trades would now be facilitated from as compared to say, Thailand Myanmar border where there are seven such points uh, from where trade gets facilitated. Importantly, we did touch upon the fact that there is uh, a demand or at least there was a proposal from uh, the Myanmar side to be able to directly settle Myanmar chat uh, with uh, Indian rupee. Uh, and and, and uh, Ambassador Vinay Kumar did mention that uh, India is looking at a much expanded uh, approach towards this uh, request. And in that case, my appeal would also be to be able to enter into some sort of a currency agreement uh, than just border related settlement, because then that covers the macro aspect of two countries uh, uh, relationship and it's not just centered towards uh, one specific uh, you know, border checkpoint. So these are some of the obviously uh, policy, cross-border pro policy aspects, which both the countries uh, should really look into. Then some are recent developments, which is but particularly due to the last two years, which the world has seen itself uh, because of the COVID situation, and which has deteriorated the business uh, condition across the globe. Uh, and uh, importantly is uh, the aftermath of global crisis 
and shortage of forex reserves in many countries. So which certainly has led to a dollar crisis like many other countries in, in Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar has brought about certain safeguard mechanisms. Uh, and, and as in when it is possible for Myanmar, they do go on to relax these mechanisms. Uh, a good example is initially Myanmar brought about the, what is colloquially known as de-dollarization notification, whereby all companies were first mandated to convert their US dollars within, I mean, authorized dealer banks were mandated to convert the Forex uh, invert remittances into Myanmar chat within a day settlement, and then went on to give relaxation to certain companies such as MIC permit holders and SCZ companies and INGOs and uh, embassies and alike. Uh, and then there were several shifts. There were uh, back and forth in the approach towards the situation. I understand because that was uh, addressed uh, on a daily basis. Uh, but that has brought about a serious ambiguity as far as businesses are concerned. Primarily, the repetitive uh, changes uh, and multiple notifications have led to many businesses not being able to understand as to what is the best approach. And for, for even to understand those nuances, they have to take a consultant's help, which is a cost in itself. Uh, the recent uh, position would be that an exporter would be able to uh, keep 35% of its export earnings into a forex, uh, that is US dollar, for instance. And 65% has to be converted. There has been certain liberty given for that exporter to be able to also sell that forex if there is surplus out of that 35% to bring about liquidity in Myanmar itself to any third party for their forex related requirements. Now, while I understand these are uh, mechanisms and it's actually a better position as compared to a forex emergency, which Myanmar sovereigns do have complete right under the foreign exchange management law to have brought about complete embargo on being able to uh, allowing remittances inward and outward. And they haven't. They have taken a much educated approach towards uh, tackling the situation. Uh, but I believe there should be some sort of relaxation factored from uh, uh, you know, the, the trading purposes, particularly uh, there, there can be some discussions held between the two countries with respect to first two countries can sit down and decide as to what are the priority sectors with respect to trade between the two countries, for instance, pharmaceutical, for instance, uh, edible oil. I understand now there is a, a scarcity in the market with respect to milk powders and things like those. And then decide on a quota allotment which should be subject to periodical review uh, by the regulators, or maybe a working group can be formulated between the two, two uh, countries. And they deliberate on a, on a regular basis as to what quota should be for a given month or a given period. So these are some mechanisms can, which can be also thought of to overcome this dollar scarcity dilemma, which almost everybody is facing. Uh, thank you, Nishan. Thank you for uh, sort of addressing the dollar issue, the dollar crisis issue, um, and also for the whole issue of policy shifts and policy roadblocks that um, uh, you have encountered. Um, um, you know, and also the the rupee chat issue that uh, the ambassador had, ambassador of India had also raised. Um, thank you very much for that. So now let me circle back uh, to Mr. Rikesh Chan, uh, just to remind you of the question. This is related to investment uh, in the ASEAN common market, particularly to the LDCs, um, uh, and. I know in, in that context, the Exim Bank at one stage had a project uh, development fund or something like that, a PDF. Um, yeah, perhaps yeah, yeah. Right. If you could also update us a little bit on that. And then um, I think the last question was uh, really sort of given your experience, uh, given the need for business continuity, uh, and given the fact that we have had a kind of disturbed situation in Myanmar, both on account of COVID as well as uh, other causes. Uh, how, what lessons can you, um, you know, what lessons can you uh, bring from your experience that our businesses could uh, take forward from this? Uh, uh, how do you deal with crises? Let's put it like these. 
Uh, sir, coming to the uh, one question you had also asked about this uh, duty free, uh, yeah, uh, duty free trade preferences. Excuse so me. I was just checking with my research group, and what they said the first reason for this not so, I mean, uh, not so used is one is lack of awareness. That is the most important thing, lack of awareness. In both countries, people are not aware about this thing that there is something called this duty free. But the other thing, sir, I mean, uh, just I was I was taking the example of Africa. So earlier from Africa, we used to get a lot of raw cashews. OK, and we have already given this kind of arrangement we have with the LDCs in Africa also. Now, a lot of Indian companies have gone there. They have set up their own shops and now the finished product is coming to India. So the most important thing for making this thing to happen is there should be a kind of balanced trade. It cannot be, let, let's say something is going from India and then from there the empty vessels are coming. Probably that will not make sense. So like timber is one example. I mean, there is a plenty of availability of timber in that country. A lot of Indian companies can go there. They can invest there and they can make it. I mean, they can do some value addition. And then from there, they can import back to India and they can enjoy this uh, this thing, uh, duty free preferential tariff, this thing. So I think we need to make people more aware about all those things. That is number one. Coming to the initiative, what we had taken, so it is called CLMB initiative. So Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. We had taken one initiative. Uh, it was through the Department of Commerce where we were the nodal agencies to promote it. But unfortunately, after spending three, four years, we could not get any, any uh, kind of uh, uh, desirable uh, kind of uh, project there. In fact, in, in Myanmar particularly, we had given one assignment to Deloitte to understand we wanted to, some Indian company wanted to uh, put up their education setup, education sector setup in uh, Myanmar. But later on, we came to know that the, the, the uh, Myanmar government doesn't have a private education policy. I mean, whether their degrees are, uh, I mean, uh, they, they will be treated at par in India when they come back from and all those things. So we tried our level best, but we were told that it will take a lot of time to come to that level and all those things. So probably we could, because of that, we could not go further on that. So that was one of the constraints. So we wanted to do something on education sector, but there is no private uh, education policy in Myanmar. That's what we understand from Deloitte. It is a report from the Deloitte. So that is the unfortunate thing. Now coming to this uh, ASEAN countries, a lot of uh, we are doing on commercial basis. We are, we are supporting a lot of Indian companies for their projects in these countries. They are putting up their manufacturing base in these countries and we are supporting on, for a long term basis, on long term basis, ranging from three years to 10 years, even up to 12 years, we are supporting them. But unfortunately, the CLMB countries, I mean, uh, Indian companies are a little bit, I mean, skeptical about uh, investing uh, reason known to everyone. I mean, one of the security reason and other reasons also. As Mr. Nishant was telling, I was happy to note that a lot of changes government of Myanmar has made in terms of the transparency, in terms of the Companies Act and all those things. So that is a good thing. That is a positive move and probably we will also pass it on to our customer. I mean, so they should not have the same thing in their mind, but at the same time, they have a different apprehension also. So I mean, with passage of time and with the clarity, I think Indian companies are all set to invest in those countries and uh, we will support. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rikesh Um, You know, I, uh, we are coming to the end of our session um, and I just want to wrap up with a couple of very quick observations. Uh, you know, one is that clearly we are stuck in a $2 billion trap. Uh, there has been some balancing of trade between that over the last few years. Initially, it was the balance of trade was very heavily in favor of Myanmar, uh, and it was all raw material exports, beans, pencil, beans, pencils, and timber. Very little value adding from that side. And from India's Indian side, there were very few experts. Now that exports have increased, but as Sunil pointed out, it's fragmented and still not contributing to that kind of cargo, uh, uh, you know, import export balance that you also referred to. So I think this is something that, uh, in terms of the future, we need to look at and crack in some ways in a, in a hard way. And I think, you know, every crisis, as they say, is an opportunity. Uh, uh, the people of Myanmar are suffering a lot under the present circumstances and businesses uh, could play a big role in trying to address the needs of the people. And one of the areas that I would suggest, uh, Mr. Rikesh, to you is that, you know, this PDF, perhaps education was the wrong place to have initially targeted. Uh, Mr. Somani uh, talked in the morning about, many people talked about agriculture. 
and SMEs in agriculture. Perhaps this is an area where we can directly benefit farmers and their produce uh, by thinking in terms of a kind of uh, a PDF uh, for promotion of SME investments in the agri sector, agri food processing, oil uh, seeds, and so on sector, uh, you know, which is going to benefit directly uh, the people. Secondly, this question of awareness. I mean, it's some, it's actually a bit shameful that after so virtually more than a decade, I think, of the DFTP, uh, which could have been a, a great instrument for to promote investment-led trade, uh, you know, into the ASEAN region as well as particularly to India, uh, that we've not been able to work out a kind of policy uh, kind of uh, mechanism in which I think buyer's credit and seller's credit, B2B, uh, could play a big role, um, uh, you know. Um, uh, I, I, I think we've missed some opportunities, um, but uh, it, it is something that we should keep in mind that uh, there is a potential scope for. So I think with those words, I would like to really thank, uh, this has been a very, very informative panel, and I'd really like to thank our three panelists, um, uh, Min Nangu, uh, Mr. Rikesh Chand, and Mr. Nishan Chaudhary, uh, for their you know excellent and frank and candid and informative uh, uh, replies to the questions. And I do hope that others who have been hearing and observing uh, have learned as much from it as uh, I think I did from both the sessions this morning. Uh, thank you. And may I hand it uh, over the, the, the conduct of the proceedings back to uh, CII. Well, thank you, Ambassador Mukhopad. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador, for really steering this session. Thank very you very much, Mr. Thank you, thank you all the panelists. Goodbye. I would just like to inform that we, while we would continue the pharma, pharmaceutical and healthcare session on this particular link, there are separate links which have been sent. And uh, so the, the panelists, I think they have already joined to the other link. So may I now invite Mr. Rajiv Rawal, Managing Director, ABC International Limited, to uh, initiate the session. I think the speakers are already there. Uh, Mr. Rajiv is an alumnus of Delhi University and I am Kolkata and presently Vice President, Managing Director, ABC International Limited. He has over close to three decades of hands-on management experience and excellence in life sciences commercialization. And uh, he has been an active member of India, Myanmar Chamber of Commerce and currently the Vice President. And uh, he is also heading one of the most important vertical of pharmaceuticals acti and actively participated in these events and witnessed the impact which have made uh, to the intended purpose. Without much ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Mr. Rajiv and uh, he could invite the other panelists to come up here. Thank you, Mr. Amitabh, for the introduction. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very interesting session I was hearing to Mr. Mukhopadhyaya, who has been a very close friend of ours previously in Myanmar. So now I start here. Uh, good morning to all the viewers from India and good afternoon to all viewers from Myanmar because Myanmar is one, one hour ahead of uh, India. So it's 12, 15 noon here. Uh, thank you so much for investing your time with us on this busy working day. Uh, my name is Raji and uh, I'll be moderating today's session. The topic, as we all know, is basically we are discussing about the collaboration opportunities in uh, pharmaceutical and healthcare. And uh, today we have some of the expert panels with us. In the panel, we have so, uh, some of the best uh, outstanding speakers. I'm going to introduce all those speakers to you soon. And uh, to start with, if you look at Myanmar, basically it's a nation with uh, almost uh, 55 million population. And uh, despite the rapid growth in the last few years, Myanmar still has a very high growth potential and the growth trajectory ahead of it. This gives a reason why we could look at Myanmar as a growth opportunity. And if you look at healthcare industry as such, Presently, it is on a very uh, primitive stage. And uh, before Myanmar realizes its economic potential, those who have invested today, I'm sure, they, and they stay invested, they are going to reap the benefits. That's a one thing which we can expect. We have classical examples in Myanmar itself. In our belt, we have some of the companies who have been here for uh, quite some time, and they are now having, uh, uh, reaping the fruits. An example of one of the classical examples, Mega Industries, Life Sciences, which stayed focused and committed to the people of Myanmar for almost three decades. The foresight with which they invested here and that they, they, these rewards are coming now. And uh, presently we have the president and chief coach, Mr. Girish Das today. We can learn from him uh, how, how, how they could scale up that and how basically where they are today. 
how to scale up the, the sheer commitment. Likewise, we, another similar case of another uh, our uh, manufacturing industry, RVK Life Sciences. Today, one of the most successful pharma factories in Myanmar. Not that they have not seen ups and downs, but the grit with which they nurtured their business brings to my next point that Myanmar is basically for lion-hearted investors who have a vision. Myanmar may not be a place for the people who are looking short-term returns. One needs to learn the culture of country and try to adjust to the pace towards growth and for the future. The next question which comes to my point is, the country would appreciate and reward you if you partner with the country and if you participate actively in the growth of the country by investing in capital and the capacity building and create value to the economy, align with the policies of the country leadership and grow along. Add value to the table, bring commitment to the table, be patient and when Myanmar attains its true potential and enterprises, you really feel proud of being associated here. Now setting the pace, we would uh, move to our panel speakers, look at the today's objective would be basically to have the perspectives of these industry experts as they share the insights and ideas that could help the listeners here to come away with something new that can be applied and have your research forward for the collaboration opportunities. You may decide these opportunities is for today or in the little late stages of Myanmar, in the Myanmar. Post that, we can open the floor for uh, any questions if the viewers have. Now, let me get started with our panel introduction. We have our speakers. I'll start with Mr. Girish Wadwa. He's a president and coach Mega Life Sciences. Mr. Girish Wadwa heads the Myanmar business for Mega Life Sciences, a company based in Bangkok, Thailand, in operation in almost 33 countries. Basically, a chartered accountant by qualification, Girish joined Mega in 1997 as a finance and commercial head and took over the country business responsibility in 2004. Mega operates as a distribution and marketing house in pharmaceutical FMPG space and is one of the country's leading corporations in the field today. Under his stewardship, Mega has associated itself with partner to almost 45 large regional companies and multinational companies, including Nestle, Associated Business Food, Servier, Sun, and many more to name. His 25-year experience on the ground, managing a large, diverse portfolio, gives him a unique perspective on the business environment of this country. Girish is an Indian citizen and lives in Yangon, Myanmar. I move to my second speaker, Mr. Rajesh Kumar, who is a managing director and CEO of RVK Life Sciences. Rajesh is MD and CEO of RVK Life Sciences and has been in the very senior positions. He started his career with Ranbaxi, moved to Dr. Reddy's, and also he was in business operations in Southeast Asia. Now, basically, sorry, he was also uh, heading uh, as a president of Bilkir and prior to his current role as a regional director for Sanofi, based out of Singapore, for ASEAN and Indochina. He is a BTEC in chemical engineering for IIT BHU and MBA from XLRI Jamshedpur. Then we have the, our third speaker, Mr. Gulshan, who has 28 plus years of experience in pharmaceutical industry, joined Dr. Reddy's almost 27 years back, grew from medical representative to a country head position in Myanmar. And last six and a half years, as a country head of Myanmar, leading rep office operation and is successfully handling the profit and loss, PNL. Born and brought up in country, a beautiful pink city, Jaipur, he completed bachelor's in biology from Maharaja College of Jaipur, India. And later, he enriched with management and business excellence from IIM Calcutta. He played various sports during college days and Rajasthan. Also, he was a Rajasthan state weightlifting champion in 1991. Happily married, blessed with one son, and hobbies are traveling, listening to Indian music and reading. And uh, we have then Mr. Nirbaraj. He has a 27 years of experience in pharma industry, worked with multinationals and uh, Indian companies. And for the last nine years, he's been international marketing head of CIPLA, uh, operate, operations for Myanmar and Nepal. He's science graduate from Mumbai University and management degree from ICFI. And uh, he belongs to Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. And last but not the last speaker, we have is uh, Dr. Harinder Singh Sidhu, who is a vice president of corporate development Apollo Hospitals. Basically, a medical doctor by qualification, Dr. Harinder Singh transited to a healthcare management portion with MBA from prestigious IBS. Uh, with rich working experience, academic ability, customer orientation, as well as expertise of international ISO integration, Dr. Sidhu has been spearheading the Apollo Hospital Group International Market Initiatives. And he has a lot of laurels to his record, which I'm sure we can have in the later stages. Now, with this introduction of speakers, I get the session started. I will uh, move to the, the first speaker, Mr. Girish Vadva. 
Mr. Girish Madhwa, welcome to the uh, session. So I address the first question to you. Today, Mega being one of the leading distribution, marketing house in pharma and FMDG space and is one of the country's leading corporation. Mega is every household name through your big portfolio, which is one of the first ones to establish an organized distribution network. Many congratulations. My first question to you would be, can you please let the viewers know how and when the journey started in Myanmar? What are the factors that could have helped you or that could have contributed to the success of Mega where it is today? Um, yes, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and good morning to our uh, viewers from India. Uh, first of all, let me thank IMCC and CII for creating this uh, opportunity for pharmaceutical and healthcare industry to meet and exchange our views. And thank you, uh, Rajivji, for your kind introduction and your kind words. Um, so uh, I, I would love to share how we started here. Uh, Mega Life Sciences uh, started this journey in Myanmar as an entity in 1995. Uh, we were the first international company to set up a marketing and distribution operation at that time. Uh, but the, the thought process to enter Myanmar started earlier than that. So as a company, as you mentioned, we are a Thai company. We started uh, business 35 years ago. And uh, we started with manufacturing of pharmaceutical and ODC products. And today we uh, operate in 33 countries. Myanmar is one of our key countries. Uh, in early 90s, when we wanted to you know, move out of Thailand to neighboring countries like Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, when we started to explore these countries, the markets were quite nascent. They were in a very uh, nascent stage. And we could not even find organized partners who would carry our products and distribute our products. And we found that many of our friends in Thailand and India also had uh, similar challenges in these three countries. And that is when the idea to set up a professional, organized, quality conscious marketing and distribution services operation uh, came up in all of these three countries. And this was to address the gap that was existing in the market and uh, to support companies like us who actually wanted to you know, be a player in these markets to, to do business in these markets. Uh, so early 90s, we had some business we did with our partners. We had one of our earliest products in the country in 1992, which was uh, called PLUS, a multivitamin. And by 1995, we had sufficient knowledge of the country to set up a company and start operations uh, with a handful of uh, you know, early principles, uh, which were primarily from uh, India and Thailand. And that was the start of our journey in Myanmar. And uh, it's been uh, quite a rewarding journey, as you mentioned. Uh, we invested uh, early, the time was, uh, you know, time is never uh, good or bad. I think uh, somebody has to make a call and uh, take the plunge. And, uh, and we have been here for uh, actively as a company for about uh, 27 years now, uh, and uh, uh, we we expect uh, uh, to be a part of the Myanmar landscape for many many decades more to come. Uh, that's that's our Myanmar journey for Mega Life Sciences. And thank you so much. And uh, that's very interesting to understand that. And now my second question would be: I know uh, this 27 years. Uh, it would not have been an easy walk, uh, the way the situation was in Myanmar and the way you have been able to come out with every kind of setup here. So what are the kind of challenges you would have come across uh, in this successful journey of 27 years? Um, in, in my view, you know, uh, I will limit my comments to uh, pharmaceuticals, right? And, uh, and, and, uh, and the country in general, uh, I would say that you know we are we are in in a region uh, we are we are Asian company. We understand developing countries. We understand the challenges. We understand the difficulties of all the developing countries because we are all on a curve. And at some point in time, we have been in similar situations as well. Uh, so uh, I would not call it cha challenges uh, per se. I would say these, these are things that 
you uh, see in many uh, developing countries and uh, you you deal with the with the landscape as you as you see it so as as you have also mentioned right and and even today we can say the same thing that the market is relatively small so that is one of the bigger bigger picture issues that uh, it's not a it's not a very huge market as such i think few years ago we we had some estimates that we did and we said uh, roughly uh, the, uh, the the on price to to consumer the 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 market uh, for pharmaceuticals uh, would be somewhere close to 758 million dollars at that point uh, so it's relatively small for a population of uh, 55 million people it is a generic market and we have uh, uh, quite a few uh, players who are active uh, most of the players who are active in this country are uh, mainly from india and the region so indonesia thailand uh, malaysia uh, so there's plenty of uh, people who are uh, already in the market and when we uh, when we look at uh, challenges i would not call it a challenge because one has to look beyond like you have very well mentioned that uh, this is a long term investment into a new country and developing a business in a new country is a long term uh, uh, it has to be a long term vision it has to be a perspective of uh, next 10 20 years and uh, that is where we feel that uh, definitely the market will grow uh, we are we have seen a um, lot of uh, changes in our last 27 year of history we have seen improvements in uh, 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 logistics, we have challenges in logistics, we have challenges in uh, I think we have lost Girish. Yeah, I think we lost Girish, correct. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just check. I'll just check. Have we lost you? I think uh, Girish is getting connected himself once again. We can just wait for a minute. Just uh, give me one minute, one minute, sir. One minute. We are checking on it. Yeah, yeah. Namitab, he's getting connected. I just spoke to him. Okay, okay. He lost us and uh, he's getting reconnected. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Girish Vadva, he is.
Hello. I hope you can hear me. Welcome, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. There seems to be a bit of a glitch in the uh, connection. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So I was talking about uh, challenges in the last 25, 27 years. So uh, I was mentioning, I don't know where I got cut off. So I will uh, start uh, not from the beginning, but from where I think I was. Uh, so in the early stages, there were difficulties in logistics. There are difficulties in uh, talent pool. There are difficulties. There were difficulties in communication, market research, data. Uh, every country has gone through these phases. So you overcome them by, you know, some things you find solutions for, some things you build yourself. Uh, for example, you know, we, we invested very early in uh, IT. We invested in infrastructure. Uh, the last uh, 10 years, we have invested more than 25 million in uh, USD in Myanmar to uh, build our infrastructure and, uh, uh, you know, market research. So we, we have our own market research, in-house market research cell that we use to collect data and information uh, over the years. Uh, we have built a huge database uh, for uh, uh, for this market to understand the market better, to understand our customers better. Uh, so there are always challenges to be overcome. And these are also opportunities for uh, people who are committed uh, to the country and to the market. So we, we look at Myanmar as a very strategic country for us, and we are fully committed. So uh, like you mentioned, you know, if you have a long-term vision for the country, then these challenges uh, are part and parcel of uh, how do we evolve and develop your business in the country? I appreciate that. And uh, one more question, uh, Mr. Girish, to you. Uh, what is the advice would you have for others who want to enter this industry in Myanmar? Since being a long term here, so I think your suggestion would be very important for the people who do the thinking of entering this market or who want to make up something in this market. So I would expect your suggestion to them. Uh, yeah, that's that's very uh, that's a very important question. Uh, as you, you have already mentioned some of the major factors that uh, are uh, that makes this market very interesting. So uh, we have a, a reasonably uh, large population. Uh, we have 55 million people here. Uh, it is a generic market, and it is uh, although it is still small, uh, there is also a lot of headroom to grow. So when you look at the size of the market and you say what it is today, uh, that is only half of the story. The other half of the story is that what it can be. And uh, we have seen uh, you know, um, a lot of change and development in the last 25 years, even in the last 10 years, you know, more clinics, more hospitals, patient access to healthcare has uh, improved uh, significantly. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it continues to grow. So if you look at next 10 to 20 years, the market will uh, evolve to be a very significant market in the region. And uh, I think that is the, that is the main uh, attraction for Myanmar, in not only in pharmaceutical, I assume in many other industries in, in sectors as well, that uh, there is a lot of headroom for growth for people who are committed and who look at it not as an opportunistic uh, market, but as a strategic market who are willing to put in the uh, time, effort, and the investment required to develop a, a business country. And uh, for us, uh, we want to be a part of the growth journey of Myanmar. Uh, we have been and we want to be. And uh, that's, that's, where, that's what makes uh, Myanmar so interesting for us. And I'm sure if people look at it from that perspective, it is a very interesting market in the next 10, 20 years uh, as well. No, th thank you, Mr. Grish, for that comprehensive, uh, uh, giving your comprehensive understanding on this thing. And uh, we really appreciate your commitment towards the people of Myanmar and this last 30 years. I think you were the first one to start that and it has been a great journey. We all appreciate that. And the people of Myanmar and the government of Myanmar also appreciates that. So thank you so much for that. Now, with that, I move to our second speaker who has another, uh, they have made another success story in Myanmar. This was another, how a beautiful manufacturing plant has been set up in Myanmar, how they could collaborate and how could they take to the next level. RVK Life Science is yet another success story. 
one of the first ones to collaborate and build a very successful manufacturing plant in Myanmar. Today, it is the largest pharmaceutical factory based on the Pulin, trying to establish the concept made in Myanmar. Many congratulations, Rajesh, for that. We really appreciate that. So now coming to you again, my question would you to you would be again, can we also hear from you your success story, how the journey started, when the thought came into mind, and how all of a sudden in Myanmar, why not other places? So that was an interesting question which was coming to mind, which would be helping the other uh, listeners also to think of Myanmar. Sure. Thanks, Rajiv. So I think it helps that we are a small group. We are not a very big group. And therefore, uh, and our growth story has actually happened in Southeast Asia. So we started off our company in Vietnam, expanded into Myanmar, and then now we are in Cambodia and Philippines and other places, as, as well as in India. So what happens is that uh, once you start off in Southeast Asia and once you get to understand the local culture and the administrative setup, it becomes much easier. And for us, uh, we actually live the credo of saying, act, uh, think global, act local. So for us now, we have uh, five manufacturing facilities, out of which the first was actually in Myanmar. And then based on our success here, we have gone ahead and bought one in India, two in Vietnam, and one in Kazakhstan. So what I'm just trying to say is that uh, we set up the whole thing more from a front-end perspective. We were a marketer, and then we reverse integrated into being a manufacturer. And uh, one of the reasons why we did it is because uh, Myanmar is a uh, field where not too many manufacturing facilities are there. The entire local manufacturing is not worth more than 5 to 6%. Now, if you juxtapose that with Vietnam, which has 70 to 80% local manufacturing today, compared to what it had 5%, the same thing, what it had uh, 20 years back, you look at Thailand, around 50, 60% is local manufacturing. You look at Indonesia, again, it is more than 80%, right? Malaysia, again, is on the 50, 60%. So most of the ASEAN countries have made sure because healthcare is a core sector, and therefore they would like to make sure that the supplies are within the country. And with COVID, what we have all learned is that it is best to have your supply lines within the country itself. And uh, we are very proud to say that we were part of this story where we could actually give essential medicines during the COVID times. So the reason for entering was we were small. So we, we, therefore we could think, think uh, a bit bigger in a smaller country. No, thank you. Actually, that is much more required. Good manufacturing units in Myanmar are much more required for a domestic uh, support. Yeah. Now, now, again, the second question to you would be again similar on the pattern. Well, I mean, not, the easy would not have the journey would not have been very easy for you, and uh, it would not have been a cakewalk. We all understand that. So again, the challenges uh, or what are the things I mean you would uh, have come across in this successful journey? That is another inter question which all other manufacturers would want to know to thinking that before coming to this country. So I would concur with my earlier esteemed speaker, uh, Mr. Girish. Actually, uh, Girish and myself have seen this country since those days because I launched uh, Randbax here way back in 95, 96, right? And that is the time that Mega also entered uh, the country. Uh, so the challenges are the same that uh, every entrepreneur goes in a developing market, which means you have to have a flexible mindset. So I think it starts off with the mindset, right? The second is you need to have a long-term vision. Uh, so you will have two or three years of disruption in the market or one or two years of disruption, but you have to look at a market from a decade perspective. So it is one decade, two decades at a time because see, development doesn't happen overnight. So if you have a long, now if the population, the local population is 55 million, it is not small. Now you put that in context of other ASEAN countries, which have much lesser population, but much bigger markets, let's say a Malaysia, then you can understand that the growth potential is quite high here. So the challenges, as I said, is a long-term vision you need to have. And last, uh, but not the least, is no relationship that you get into any market. Now, whether it be this market or a developed market as well, uh, starts with a complete understanding of your partner. So you improvise as you go along. And I think we did that. So we were quite flexible. At a lot of times, you feel that this relationship might not go ahead. But I think today we are in a pretty comfortable situation with whatever we have done and with our partners as well. So that, that made a lot of difference. At the same time, uh, you have to get on board 
partners who have a long term vision and get off board partners who have a short term vision interesting that's very interesting rajesh i also remember the su suggestion before we coming to myanmar had some discussion with you i still uh, those uh, discussions are very yeah. fresh in my mind <laughs> yeah that we were in doctor at that time yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. since so both of us in doctor at that time okay now rajesh my another last question to you would be uh, similar to what i is uh, asked mr girish also what advice would you have for others who want to set up a similar kind of direction in myanmar since myanmar requires a lot of new manufacturing units uh, and uh, that is a basic requirement so your advice would be very very important for uh, those uh, people who are planning to set up uh, units here yeah the first thing what one has to understand this is very unlike india you don't have an ecosystem here right you don't have an ecosystem in terms of so i was hearing uh, our uh, colleague from exim bank and who was mentioning rightly that education system is not very formalized so you don't have a proper ecosystem in terms of trained manpower especially in the manufacturing sector you don't have an ecosystem in terms of machinery and repairs so you need to be ready to be able to import a lot of the stuff the second and this totally flies in the face of all management uh, guidance and uh, uh, if you have come from harvard they will teach you just in time uh, but here just in time doesn't work right so i have 12 to 15 months of inventory of raw material lying with me because you see there are so many disruptions in the supply chain that you need to be ready for the long haul so that's what i said if you want a streamlined uninterrupted supply chain going into the market then you need to invest at least 12 months which means you need to have cash flows so you have to have enough cash flows if you think you require x plan for 3x right what helped us as as rv group as i said we are not too big we are approximately 1200 crores by indian standards around 160 million dollars but the biggest strength that we have is we are zero debt we have no leverage so that helps us in a market like this so if you are highly leveraged in a market of this kind then there you are there you are in trouble and you should be willing to take the highs and the lows as well so you have to try you have to understand the country culture and uh, go as per that you can't have those international things at every part no and so that's that's why i said it's it's a very local context if yeah. people talk about just in time here they they might as well shut shop and go back i i, I appreciate that i appreciate that thank you thank you rajesh for all those that uh, but but there's a dire need of good manufacturing plants here i think sure. your uh, uh, views would be i uh, i hope for many and uh, i'm sure the people who would like to think of coming out of the plants here sure and thank you. Uh, now i move to our next speaker uh, dr harinder singh sidhu dr harinder okay. yes sir good very good afternoon good afternoon good afternoon Now, and my many congratulations for uh, taking a Apollo Hospital flagship global. We are really proud of uh, the same, and uh, good luck for many more such initiatives. Go global, go Apollo. We feel proud of it. So now, now having come to you, now the my first question to you would be something like: uh, We see thousands of patients visiting the uh, uh, Apollo chain of hospitals from Myanmar. I, I'm sure it would be same globally from other countries also. But uh, the my question would be because we've been hearing a lot that Apollo. has been planning to come to myanmar there's some discussions could you please uh, throw some light on it uh, because uh, myanmar needs a lot of good corporate hospitals yeah no thank you first of all thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting me to this forum thank you to the moderator for giving this opportunity and it's been wonderful listening to the speakers before me in fact you know the way it's been presented and looks like that i should be moving to myanmar myself very soon <laughs> given the opportunities available there Uh, but that's on a personal note. From a company perspective, from our organization, Apollo, yes, has been serving uh, patients from all over the world. In fact, from more than 140 countries. Uh, but to give you the context of how important our relationships with Myanmar are, one of our flagship hospitals, which is in New Delhi, you now we we receive patients all across India. But the New Delhi hospital today, as we see, uh, we see a very large number of patients coming from Myanmar, and they come for critical illnesses like. organ transplant for kidney diseases liver diseases and for oncology which are a uh, slightly expensive proje uh, procedure so as a value wise uh, myanmar is the highest contributor to our international uh, business coming to apollo delhi so that is the importance for myanmar 
uh, for the Apollo group and for the hospital, particularly in Delhi. Uh, now coming to more important question of which you have been saying about listening, hearing about Apollo coming to Myanmar. Uh, let me share that Apollo currently in the last couple of years has a slight change of policy. It was before COVID, not that COVID has something to do with it. Uh, we have been focusing a lot on growth within the country in India. Uh, we moved very fast from about 40 hospitals about five years back to now 73 hospitals across India. And we built a chain of uh, pharmacies with 5,000 retail pharmacy stores. Uh, we are not manufacturers like the previous speakers, but we have the largest retail network. Uh, we have about 100 diagnostic clinics. So there's a lot of investment gone within India, which in the last couple of years has limited us to invest outside India. Uh, it's not about Myanmar or any other country. But given that, we have not stopped ourselves and we have not hesitated from investing our resources, our expertise. So in the past also, we have managed a hospital in Bangladesh, in Oman, in Sri Lanka, a few other countries where we have brought in as an operations management partner for the uh, hospital locally. So similarly in Myanmar, there have been some opportunities. There have been talks with some partners uh, where they wanted us to come and help them in either starting a new hospital or turnaround project for an existing hospital. Uh, there were some things which were uh, moving well, but again, that came to a halt because of the COVID and some of the let's say vision of the partners were not the same what they were before COVID and things changed a bit. As we speak, there are again talks at very early stages, very early stages where there are uh, people interested. We all know there's a big need, especially for the tertiary care services. While Myanmar is good in a lot of other areas, but the tertiary care services, there's a big need. Uh, we have the expertise. There are uh, local investors and local leaders who are interested in setting up a facility. Let's hope something matures and we'll be very happy to have a hospital in Myanmar as soon as it can be. Great, thank you so much. So as we understand, uh, but but you are open to uh, partner in Myanmar if you have good partners and uh, who are uh, uh, kind of investors and uh, you could give your uh, been, uh, kind of expertise in that. That's what Absolutely, I absolutely. We are open to partners, but I won't say that we are open to partners just because they have the money. They should have the same vision. Uh, they should have, I, like I'm just saying, the speakers before us had a vision to set up it locally. It was not an activity to extract business from Myanmar. So somebody who has a vision of making sure the healthcare services improve, it, it helps the local economy, it helps the local people to get access to better health care. We are very, very open to such collaboration. That's good. That's it also helps us, you know, to undergo the, understand the local dynamics, the local business environment. If somebody... The, like I said, the people who have set up factories and other businesses have gone through challenges. It should not take us the same time to go through the challenges. The local partner will definitely help us streamline and make things happen faster. So one is a vision and the second is a long-term commitment uh, both the parties should have uh, for a long-term sustainable kind of partnership. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And uh, But also let me understand, uh, we have been observing that your teams are still visiting Myanmar and I think... Uh, they are supporting the uh, Myanmar community here. Is that what I understand? Absolutely. Good absolutely. job here. Absolutely. So, uh, a team of specialists from Apollo, especially for liver transplant, kidney transplant, cancer, and a few other specialities. We have been visiting Myanmar for the last, I would say, at least 10 to 12 years. Uh, they come on a very regular basis, maybe every three months, four months, where they, one, work with the local doctors, do conduct CMEs. I'm so you all from the pharma industry know of CMEs more than me. So they have been conducting those CMEs. Uh, very importantly, our relationship has been is to help build services, build capacities. So while we come there and share the latest advances in various specialties, uh, we have invited many doctors and paramedicals for training with us. If I have to give a ballpark figure, if you include all the people trained doctors, paramedical nurses, we would have done about 80 to 100 of them who've come to us in training in various specialties in helping them start something on liver program, and kidney and in other associated programs. So we have we help build capacity locally where they can learn from here and go back and contribute to the economy. As we speak, there are talks happening. We are working with some of the good government hospitals like the Defense Services Medical Academy and the Myanmar Specialist Hospital where we are helping them with protocols and training to set up a liver transplant program. A liver transplant program is one of the very high-end tertiary care procedures. So. Uh, if things go well the way are, we should soon have some the hospitals in Myanmar performing liver transplant. That, that's a great initiative. Capacity building is one thing which you're working on, and that is very much required for this country. 
So now one more uh, last question. I, I think though you have answered it, but some some good advice you would have for others who want to uh, who are thinking on the same lines or want to set up in similar direction. You would suggest something on that. Uh, see, as far as my simple uh, process for thinking for any collaboration, any partnership, and with a country like Myanmar, where India and Myanmar have enjoyed great relationships, the friendship, the bahami we have together, the first advice would be. don't look at a transactional relationship with myanmar for any partner should not be looking at okay i go do this get it out of it it has to be a long term relationship it has to be a relationship where there is a win win uh, especially in our field the first win has to be for a patient he has to get good health care he has to get good clinical outcomes so if you can offer that then please come in and help the country there if you can offer this uh, health care at good prices it is good so look at a long term wholesome vision don't look at a uh short term vision for the partnership with myanmar then you will have certain challenges like all of us have faced maybe a little bit in language in some cases for us especially when patients some of them who can't speak english but there are solutions we have translators with us we have full time translators a little bit of culture thing is something which we can always work around food habits so i won't say there are major roadblocks or anything yes there are ways we can further enhance this collaboration one i would say if there is a way i don't know it's not that forum or we or you individually can do anything is to see if there is a possibility of increased flight connectivity uh, definitely if we have more flights we have more mobility between the two nation we will see more people coming in uh, it will be easier access for all and which will help grow this partnership further you are right i think that discussion was already there with the previous ambassadors uh, present the ambassador also that we are going to have an increased uh, flight frequency between uh, india and myanmar so i think that's the advice any advice come come with a good intent come with a long term vision be ready to face a few things here and there which are easily manageable and it's a very very good country to be friends with thank you thank you dr arinda for your views i am sure this would be quite helpful to the people who are listening to us and uh, in uh, their thoughts of uh, uh, taking the forward their decision of uh, hospital sector in myanmar thank you so much thank you very much thank you uh now i moved over the next speaker mr gulchan arora uh mr gulchan arora is the dr reddys and uh, uh, dr reddys has been there in myanmar for quite some time and uh, uh, has been one of the very successful pharma companies in myanmar one of the very trusted brand by the medical fraternity we all are proud of the same uh, mr gulchan congratulations for leading from the front and uh, we need these kind of global companies global indian multinationals in myanmar which provide very high quality drugs at an affordable price So now coming to the you the first question would be again how do you see the journey today and going forward how dr reddy looks into it and what are the contributing factors for dr reddy's in myanmar uh, for this successful journey so thank you mr rajiv first of all for this uh, uh, introduction which you did initially and then thanks ia and i am sufi for arranging this platform where we are able to exchange the thoughts this is really going to be helpful now coming back to your question right journey of dr reddy's in myanmar has been very exciting as well as fulfilling because obviously as as part of commercial organization numbers are important but if you look at the way it has been fulfilling because from the day one the company focus was what can we offer which is probably going to help the patient or the hcps so in a very initial days of dr reddy's the the leaders could really think about and get that opportunity through market research and we were very happy to launch even in those times we were one of the first companies to come with the biologics right and that gives us a lot of respect basically because of which a lot of people were able to afford the medicines there are a lot of people early those who used to travel to neighboring countries only because those medicines were not available so yes it's a commercial success but if we look back we have won the heart of people and we had really contributed to the society by either increasing the the life expectancy or saving the lives right so so this is something which is very very fulfilling part of the journey and uh, maybe the next set we we also see now those changes are going to be a uh, more significant because now the way things have moved in last 3 years right the nature of disease pattern is changing right all of a sudden now everybody is talking about the viral disease onset and what happens in one part of the globe it can reach out very fast to the next country right so how can we come out with those solutions and help the healthcare pro uh, providers 
then the the way if we look at myanmar uh, so one of the advantage if you look at as a company the kind of digital penetration it has right so this is going to be the game changer the companies those who are going to leverage those kind of opportunities which are available i think my previous speakers were talking about so somebody has to come somebody has to come with a uh, i will say this the term which everybody is using lo global global so you need to be global in vision but you need to be very very clear what is going to happen in local so so that has been really helpful right so this is what i think i and in terms of once again when you are talking about what are the contributing factors so once again uh, this approach we came out the with the global products but we did not offer everything what was there in our portfolio because as you know dr reddy is available in 66 countries and we have a large portfolio so there is always a possibility that we can dump each and everything which we are exporting but that was never the strategy there was a lot of market research done how we can help and what is going to add value so that selection of products from day one that has really helped in the company to 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 travel and then get that kind of image which you are talking about so this is really helpful great great and uh, thank you again no 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 again the second question too again would be that uh, uh, the journey would not have been very uh, cake walk uh, what are the kind of uh, challenges as a company you would have faced and uh, it's from both the sides from uh, from the indian indian side and from myanmar side and uh, the third i any solutions to those uh, kind of uh, uh, challenges what you face so on a lighter side i think uh, there is a lot of serious discussion happening since morning so i would like to say the most difficult part is if anybody who joins in your uh, organization and he wants to say okay please explain myanmar these are the most three <laughs> difficult words right because uh, <laughs> all of us know right uh, myanmar being so close to india but very very different very dynamic right and especially people those who have not visited myanmar and then they try to see it is extension of yes there are a lot of cultural uh, similarities but market has its own dynamics right so this was on the lighter part but yes in terms of i will not say challenges because every market will come with their own set of opportunities and they will come out with the certain certain things which the company has to work on right because we cannot complain about the market our, our job is to find out solution but we believe at least in one or two areas where the if country will take some positive step it will be win win for both so one is like uh, the new product registration timelines right this is something uh, where we believe uh, the myanmar government has already done well in terms of earlier the entire process used to be uh, i think hard copies now it has been online so there is some progress which has happened but still i think uh, if it can be fast paced and if the 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 timeline can be reduced so it will be win win the companies will be able to come out with newer product as a faster pace and the patients will get good quality medicines at affordable price faster so this is one similarly i think uh, uh, myanmar in some ways right uh, they try to to protect right uh, the trade right so like one example could be if if once you engage with somebody right and then you have to live with that for a longer duration especially in last 3 years the way we have learned in covid right uh, so if those kind of freedoms are available with both the parties so basically what we are suggesting is if those kind of protections are not given and then basically the competition in the market can be increased so it is going to be once again win win how the, the patient will get same quality medicines with much more affordable price because of the competition and very good example itself which exists in myanmar is look at all of us know that there are no mrps on the medicine but still in a very beautiful way that ecosystem is that everybody gets at the same price so if similar things can be done right it will improve the quality of distribution and the way we have seen uh, mr girish was talking about the way they have made the difference right so similarly uh, this will really improve the quality of distribution patients will be able to get very good quality of medicine at a much affordable price 
So you are suggesting business should not have a lifelong marriage. There should be some breakage in that. Anyway, lifelong marriage is okay. <laughs> no, in business, I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay. Now, 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 now again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Gulchan. Now, my uh, another question to you would be again, uh, same thing on uh, what is the kind of advice you would have, like to give to others who want to, I mean, uh, something like a uh, doctorate would be kind of a, I mean, uh, inspiration for many of those who want to come up in this country. So again, what is the suggestion you would like to give to those people who want to have a set, who want to I mean, set up in a similar kind of a direction? So once again, I think uh, some of the points which I have covered, so be very unique. What happens is like there are a lot of manufacturers, those who are now looking at Myanmar. And every second company which will approach, they will look at some kind of import data and they will say multivitamins are selling very well, right? So I want to give you multivitamin, right? So. So we need to we need to understand the need of the customer. Like uh, the market is small, but customer is very very intelligent. Right? Customer is very aware. Look at the literacy level. This kind of literacy level is much better than most of the neighboring countries, including India. Right. So people know what they are buying. So it is not that if some multivitamin is doing well, the next version which is similar, even by reducing the price. So be very clear in terms of if we are having a new offering how I am going to help the patient. So uniqueness is very, very important in terms of offering. And second, as, as uh, Mr. Rajesh was also saying, many of the partners, when they come, they have a short-term view, right? So this is not the market. Uh, as you were also saying, uh, this is a market for people with law and heart. This is the, the, peop uh, the people should come to Myanmar with long-term commitment, right? One or two years can, can go this way or that side. But if you have a commitment, like all successful companies, those who have done well, that commitment is very, very important. And people value that commitment, especially last three years, the way Mr. Rajesh was talking about on Mr. Girish, the companies, those who were able to ensure the, the availability of medicine during those tough times, healthcare professionals, you talk about pharmacies, you talk about patients, everybody values. So this, is, this was the time to, to serve the community. And if you have a long-term vision, right, then only those kind of things will come to you. So selection of partner that way also is very, very important. Great. Again, again, it comes back to that same, same commitment and a long-term vision is one thing which you are also in the same lines. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gulchan. And now we move to our next speaker, Mr. Nirparaj uh, Joshi. Uh, Mr. Nirparaj, he, again, here, uh, Mr. Yes. Nirparaj is with Sipla. Sipla is yet another successful company from India in Myanmar. And I think it is one of the most trusted name in respiratory segment. All, all congratulations for that, Nipuraj. Now coming to you, we will put up, start with that again. How do you see the journey today and going forward? Again, same thing. I would all like to ask you what could have been the contributing factors for you for that kind of success in Myanmar as a respiratory segment in company. Okay. So thank you, uh, Mr. Raji. Uh, also, I would like to thank CIA and uh, uh, UMFCCI for uh, arranging this conference. As you rightly said, you know, Sipla is a success story, but uh, the story of Sipla is different, you know. Sipla not only just makes medicines or sells medicine, you know, it is a uh, uh, place where we want to make difference, you know, it is a story Sipla which has, you know. So we have a guiding philosophy or purpose which is caring for life. And we have a trust almost eight decades in India, more than eight decades in India of uh, uh, HCP, healthcare professionals, as well as patients who trust in Cipla brands. And uh, what Cipla brings to the table is high quality medicines with affordability. You know? So with the largest range of SQ with uh, 25,000 plus SQs in India and across the geographies. So Cipla is a very success story because of our respiratory focus. Wherever we are doing, you know, we are focused in terms of developing the potential of the market not only in terms of HCP, in terms of patients, also developing the therapy. Like in respiratory, you know, respiratory comes out to be only asthma sort of thing. But we have worked in developing COPD, allergic rhinitis, ILD-related work. Even during the pandemic time, you know, we were one of the few companies which supplied remdesivir, even the COVID test kits to Myanmar, you know. So this is the story. And in uh, uh, Myanmar, we have been there for last 20 years. And uh, so after 2014, we created a DTM where we had our own uh, uh, subsidiary to operate in there. And uh, beyond respiratory, we have focused on ARVs, which we are a major player there. Also cardiology, urology, and some oncology products. 
and uh, this is our story you know so we are present in more than 100 plus countries with the philosophy of none shall be denied you know great 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 and again my same question would come to you also and uh, the, what are the kind of challenges you would have faced uh, uh, in myanmar or i mean going global how do you find those challenges Right. So I think uh, as rightly told by many speakers earlier, like the market attractiveness is not huge, you know, because the company from India, if you're not present. So uh, but what we found is the suffering of hepatitis B and uh, HIV patients were huge in Myanmar before a decade back. So this is where when we have a philosophy of none shall be denied, we thought of entering into this market with HIV drugs and hepatitis B drugs, which I think we were the many uh, of the first molecules which were introduced in the market and which made difference to the life of patients. And uh, similarly, in case of respiratory, you know, uh, the market was on orals. We moved to inhalers, which is a better therapy. So we created a lot of uh, approach in that. So market also developed uh, and we also grew together. So that's what uh, the approach we had. So now the current challenges is, you know, in India, uh, we have a lot of set of contract manufacturers, supply is a large company, so we have a huge set of contract manufacturers. So we cannot get those drugs of contract manufacturer easily in Myanmar. Second is the timeline, you know, new molecule takes almost two and a half years to three years time. So by that time, new molecules are introduced. So these two things are addressed. We can uh, provide more molecules and uh, we can uh, support in other therapies in Myanmar. That's what my belief is. Interesting, interesting. So again, uh, la last but not the least, I mean, the question is that, uh, what is kind of advice you would have for other who are, I mean, uh, trying to uh, set up a similar kind of direction in Myanmar? What is that as a simple as a company you would like to suggest? Uh, I think every, all speakers have said, you know, we need to have a strategic long-term vision is required, but you need to bring on table what is your expertise, you know, with the localization philosophy, you know, you cannot uh, have a template of uh, India or other countries just implementing that. The market is unique and dynamic. So we need to have a localization policy and with the long-term plans, I think you can make it a success with a good population neighborhood of India. I think we can uh, encash on a long-term vision and uh, this is the perfect time I feel to invest there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Right Now, uh, I think we have uh, some lot of good views coming from all the uh, speakers. We open the floor uh, to our people, uh, all who are here with us. If they have any questions from the panel, please they can uh, put the questions forward. We are just checking on the other platform, Hype, if there have been any question from the participant, just give me a minute. Sure, sure. Sorry, Mr. Rajiv, there is uh, no question as such over there, but definitely I would request the participants to please use the CII platform for B2B engagement. We have already sent a detailed note. In case you are interested in getting across to any participant from Indian side or the Indian companies getting across to Myanmar side, they could uh, send a request, meeting request through the Hive or send a mail to us. We'll definitely facilitate a meeting with them. Fine, fine, Mr. Amita. So now, now as we come to, as all good things need to come to an end, to sum up what I feel is, I strongly believe healthcare in Myanmar is still at a very primitive stage. And for sure, the market will flourish in coming time, coming years, like the neighboring countries as we look at. And uh, I'm sure it is going to scale up to something three to four billion in coming times. It's a question of time. And uh, Indian Pharma being one of the major pillars in Myanmar, the most trusted and admired by Myanmar medical fraternity will surely get the maximum mileage. And uh, Myanmar, as we say, it is a nation with 55 million population, has a great po potential and a great trajectory ahead of it. This gives a reason why we should look at Myanmar as an opportunity. And uh, again, coming back to those points, what all of us have uh, felt is important. All those committed to Myanmar and have foresight can surely uh, get the rewards. Myanmar is again for lion-hearted lion investors who have a vision. Myanmar may not be placed for those who are looking at short-term returns and uh, it is basically for long-term who have a great vision. The country would appreciate if you partner with them and participate actively in the growth of the country. To sum up, all those who are here in Myanmar who witness this growth phase is almost magical. With this, I think uh, 
uh, I don't know in case any more suggestions, any more views from Mr. Girish, Mr. Rajesh, Mr. Gulshan, Mr. Nirvraj and Dr. Sidhu. Please, uh, you may have any views, anything more you would like to say on that. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. I think, uh, thank you. I think across the group, we have fairly well covered. Yeah. The only thing uh, with my last two colleagues, uh, Gulshan and uh, Nirparaj, I think the way to shorten the regulatory, and I think all of us are facing the heat where it is not just taking two to three, but three to four years for the registration. So that is, uh, uh, you know, making uh, it a bit difficult to get the later generation products into the market. For that, uh, local manufacturing is the way. And uh, we are getting post our technology transfer here, we are getting registration within one year. So I think the one way to fast track, and I think Zydus Cattle has actually uh, is uh, one company which has also done the same. Yeah. So fine. With that, we come to the close of the session. I would like to thank our Indian ambassador, uh, Mr. Vinay Kumar, and uh, Myanmar ambassador, Mr. So Cho Ong, and uh, of course, CII. INCC, Indian Embassy in Myanmar, and our great speakers and the viewers. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, spending your day with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It's been thank a pleasure. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sidhu. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Sidhu, for being here. Thank you.